Bien, le bonjour à tous les monde. Muy bon día a todos. Muy buenos días a todos. And a good day to you all. My name is Dr. Ian Ralby, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this event put on by Three Stones International and the NATO Hub for the South. Today, we are going to be discussing a critical issue in world affairs. In 2019, the headlines around the world declared that the Gulf of Guinea was the most dangerous maritime space on Earth. Since then, many who operate in the area would have to agree the situation has only become worse, more difficult, more dangerous, and seemingly more intractable. But today, we are going to be exploring how to approach this issue through enhancing the training, the education, and the exercising in the maritime domain of the region. We have an incredible group of people to speak today on how to do this and how to make security, governance, and development in the maritime domain of West and Central Africa a reality and to combat all the threats, not just those most dramatic uh, that face the region today. Before we get into it, I'm delighted to welcome my colleague, Marianne Schreiner from Three Stones International to get us started for the day. Marianne. Thank you, Ian, and uh, looking forward to today's session. Uh, just a brief introduction from my side because we want to spend most of our time on this important dialogue. My name is Mary Ann Schreiner, as Dr. Ian uh, had mentioned, and I'm with Three Stones International based here in Kigali, Rwanda. Three Stones is a US registered uh, research and management firm and focused uh, in Africa. And we are supporting during this uh, dialogue with the uh, series with uh, NATO South Direction Hub to um, assist in the dialogue should you require. Uh, we will have quite a large um, audience and looking forward to your engagement uh, on the chat on the side and you're welcome to do so to put your comments and questions there and we will direct those as much as possible to the appropriate panelists in order to answer your questions. And just so you know, your inputs as the audience member will also be included to inform the final report for publication. Uh, and just to keep the flow and to make sure that we give our esteemed panelists and NATO the appropriate time, uh, we will ask that the audience remains on mute and keeps the video off during the dialogue. And um, it should any questions come up or we call on you, we will um, ask you to unmute at that time. And uh, we welcome constructive criticism and honest engagement. Um, we just really want to ensure that um, inappropriate and non-constructive comments are um, not brought forward in this discussion. And uh, we will not be tolerating that and will result in uh, any removal from the uh, webinar. So thank you. That's all for me on the logistics side. And we look forward to the dialogue ahead. Thank you, Dr. Ian. Back to you. Thank you very much. It is now my great pleasure to uh, introduce the NATO Strategic Direction South Hub. Um, I am delighted to welcome the General to give us some opening remarks. Good morning here. Very good morning. Uh, really early, I guess, uh, in the place where you live. Uh, and good afternoon to everybody. I'm uh, David Re, Brigadier uh, General from Italian Air Force and Director of uh, the dire uh, NATO Strategic Direction South Hub. Due to time, I want to introduce my team, uh, but you will be engaging them. Uh, great experts uh, from uh, the Hub uh, team. First of all, let me say that uh, the NATO Strategic Direction South Hub was created uh, in, 2000, in 2017. We started our first step. Our main aim is to better understand the regional dynamics, uh, the, uh, the, the regional dimension, mainly in the North Africa, Sub Sahara, and the Middle East through the engagement of selected partners. And we do that uh, to identify with them uh, potential emerging challenges but mainly opportunities for cooperation. In the Gulf of Guinea, as you mentioned, unfortunately is one of the most dangerous area. I was identified by EU as a 95% 90%, 95 of the uh, kidnapping for ransom in 2020. 
And of course, uh, uh, we know that uh, EU is leading the role for coordinating uh, uh, the activities uh, to coordinate it uh, as an international partner with the Gulf of Guinea and other international organizations, such as uh, UN Office for Drug and Crime, Interpol, and of course, uh, the Gulf of Guinea uh, Commission through the Yandu uh, Code of Conduct. Uh, our aim is uh, just to have a better understanding of the region on the dynamics, uh, on the coordination, on the achievement uh, that this architecture has uh, reached uh, so far and also to understand how eventually NATO may provide support on education, training, uh, again, uh, to enhance, uh, with the only aim uh, to enhance possibly uh, maritime security uh, in uh, the area. So this is my brief uh, presentation. I thank also uh, all the uh, very authoritative uh, uh, panelists, uh, uh, as uh, you see, uh, the variety of expertise uh, is really uh, wide uh, from uh, naval experience, of course, legal, legal experience, uh, commercial experience. Uh, why? Because, of course, uh, this is not only an operational uh, understanding, but is a 360 multi comprehensive uh, understanding of those dynamics uh, from fishery, from commercial, uh, from, uh, of course, also on the operational side for which NATO may provide a role in coordinating and enabling some expertise that we have, such as center of excellencies or operational commands in order, again, to project stability by assisting partners and the countries. It's a fascinating area of the world with 6,000 kilometers of coastline, 19 countries. And we are here just to learn uh, from you uh, the challenges and the endeavors uh, to provide maritime security in this uh, part of the globe. Thank you very much. I will uh, give you back the floor, Jan. General, thank you very much. And thank you to the Hub for the spirit of connection and communication and engagement that has uh, permeated all of the uh, activities the Hub has run since its outset. Um, I am delighted to introduce, uh, uh, really, as the, Admiral says, as the uh, General says, a fantastic, fantastic panel today. Uh, we have people who uh, know this issue inside and out better than anyone else on earth, and um, we have the opportunity to engage in a dialogue. So uh, as my colleague said, please do take us on uh, in terms of engaging through the chat uh, as we will try to incorporate uh, all perspectives over the course of the coming hours. I myself have worked in maritime security uh, throughout my career. I was a maritime lawyer by background, and I've had the honor and pleasure to work in more than 80 countries around the world. Um, the pleasure, though, of working in the Gulf of Guinea uh, is perhaps paramount because the opportunity to engage with the professionals uh, has enriched my life and my career in a way that uh, is, is really hard to express. So this is personally quite an honor for me, uh, and it's hopefully going to be as dynamic a conversation uh, as is often the case with the Gulf of Guinea. But let me add a few comments to what the general just said about the Yaoundé Code of Conduct in order to contextualize who it is that we are talking with and the framework for maritime security that has been established in the region. Going back in history, it's worth noting that the first IMO resolution on piracy ever established in 1983 was actually on the Gulf of Guinea. So when talking about piracy in the Gulf of Guinea, it is not a new phenomenon. However, it has become more acute in recent years. In 2013, the states of the region came together and established a framework for cooperation. Uh, and the head of states across all of West and Central Africa established a mandate for the coastal and landlocked states to cooperate. In 2014, the African Union then proceeded to publish its Africa Integrated Maritime Strategy 2050. And so if we look at this from an architectural standpoint rather than a sequential one, we have at the apex a Africa Integrated Maritime Strategy 2050 that sets forth how the states around the entire continent are intending to secure, govern, and importantly, develop the blue economy of Africa. Beneath that, in West and Central Africa, the uh, economic communities of ECOWAS of West Africa and ECAS of Central Africa came together along with the Gulf of Guinea Commission to establish the Yaoundé architecture, whereby 
two regional operational centers, Cresmac in Central Africa, based in Point Noir, Congo, and Cresmeo in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, would be coordinated through an interregional coordination center in Yaoundé, Cameroon. Within each of those two regions, Central Africa and West Africa, there are a series of zones. Zone A includes Angola, Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Republic of Congo. There is no zone B, there is no zone C. So skipping through the alphabet, we get to zone D, wherein we have Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, and Sao Tome. And moving into ECOWAS, we have zone E, which includes Nigeria, Togo, Benin, and the landlocked, or as they call themselves, land-linked state of Niger. Uh, zone F, uh, which is uh, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Guinea, and again, a land-linked state of Burkina Faso. And zone G, uh, which is Guinea-Bissau, Gambia, Senegal, Cabo Verde, and the land-linked state of Mali. Now, each of these zones is intended to have an operational center, a multinational maritime coordination center. Three are currently operational, one in Douala, Cameroon for zone D, one in Cotonou, Benin for zone E, and one in Accra, Ghana for zone F. That is the architecture of security cooperation in the region. Now, the question is, how is it working and what is happening? And one of the problems that we have when talking about the Gulf of Guinea is that we go immediately to piracy and we go to the spectacular situation that we now confront ourselves in uh, where uh, pirates have become very, very uh, frequent in their attacks and hostile towards seafarers. Years ago, the, the main focus was oil. Now the main focus is people. And that has changed the urgency and the seriousness of the situation. Furthermore, the geographic expanse has grown well beyond the Niger Delta where it was originally focused to include states as far afield as Cote d'Ivoire, Angola, Sao Tome, and beyond. And this increase in both the rate attacks, the severity of the attacks, and the frequency of the attacks has led to calls across a lot of different entities from uh, foreign navies to international organizations like the IMO to the shipping industry uh, for an urgent change in the status quo. So the question we're really looking at today is how do we change that status quo through education, training, and exercising, and what can NATO usefully do to help that process along? So with us today are some fantastic professionals who can speak to these issues from an array of perspectives, from the diplomatic to the political, to the operational, to the legal, and beyond. And it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce the first of our speakers today, Ambassador Hadija Mustafa. Now, before I give her the floor to speak, let me say that there are four critical questions that I hope she and all our, our speakers will be able to help answer over the coming uh, hour. The first is, what are the real needs for education, training, and exercising to improve maritime security in the Gulf of Guinea? There is no point in providing education and training that is not needed. If it is already being done in some other form, we don't want to duplicate effort uh, and to waste everyone's time. So what are the real needs? What is the current situation? In order to understand what those needs are, we need to understand the baseline. What is happening? What are the exercises? What are the training programs? What are the educational opportunities? Number three, what is the status of coordination and cooperation to achieve that education, training, and exercising? One of the big problems that uh, the region confronts is that everyone now has an interest in this area. And so as all the international organizations, international partners, private sector entities, foundations, educational bodies all jump into the mix. How can we coordinate efforts so that we aren't taking up all of our time just in the very fact of duplicating uh, the exact same attempt to uh, engender true education training and exercising? And finally, how can NATO play a useful role in this process and support the maritime security education training and exercising in the region. So those are the four key prompts. So now to Ambassador Mustafa. Ambassador Hadija Mustafa is a truly exceptional diplomat. She is uh, currently the advisor to the African Union's, uh, the, the chair of the African Union Commission. So while she hails from Nigeria, uh, she sits in Addis and I am delighted to offer uh, the floor to her. Ambassador Mustafa, uh, the floor is yours. Your thoughts on how to proceed. 
Thank you, Ian, for the intro, for the kind introduction, and thank you to to uh, Three Stones International and the NATO Hope for putting this dialogue together. Um, it is very this dialogue is very very important. And but before, as a way of introduction, and for the relevant, I mean, I have done a few uh, things I'm proud of, um, but the one that is related to this is the fact that I was in Yahunde 2013 when the uh, Gulf of Guinea summit met, uh, the Gulf of Guinea heads of state met, and you talked about the architecture, uh, the Yahunde code. I was also lucky to be there when the uh, ICC was launched. But I must say, Ian, that the most, my favorite of all of that is my visit to the uh, three islands of the Bakasi Peninsula. So I like to talk about coastal, um, coastal and borderland communities. So I wanted to uh, put that up front because when we are talking about education, training, and exercises for um, for insecurity in the maritime um, maritime domain like you said we usually just concentrate on security safety and um, to, and to a very great extent uh, military approaches so i want to be upfront that um, i really am glad that we're having this dialogue and i'm hoping that um, we are going to concentrate uh, on non-military uh, non-military training now, um, in terms of introduction to, to my brief talk, and I'd like to start uh, from what the Secretary General of NATO said about uh, NATO relations with Africa. And um, I like to quote, and he said, what happens in Africa matters for our security. And he describes Africa as a neighbor of NATO regions where NATO operates. Let me echo these sentiments by saying, or by stating the obvious that we in the continent um, have, have long historical relations with member states of NATO. And a lot of our countries and our regional, our member states and our regional um, organizations also have bilateral relations and multilateral relations with, um, with NATO. So for us, this is a long-term relationship, but this is a relationship that we are happy to see improvement in. And the Gulf of Guinea, for, for, for Europe, and for us, the Gulf of Guinea is very important because I mean, for him to say that we are neighbors and the importance of Gulf of Guinea is for both us in the continent and you mentioned AIMS, uh, which is the, our strategy and the vision of that strategy is really to for wealth creation, the way that Africans can exploit, sustainably exploit the, uh, the blue economy uh, for the economic growth of, um, of our continent. So this is a good starting point for me because I think that we need to change the narrative. We need to look at some of the ways we have been doing cooperation. Uh, and I'm glad that I have seen uh, one or two people that have written about over concentration on military or on security in the debt and no traction to the soft powers, if you like. And the soft powers for me then is to say that training, education should now concentrate on maritime development, maritime governance, maritime uh, business. I know, and I'm saying this with clear assumption or clear knowledge that NATO, of course, is a military alliance. 
I'm also saying this because I know that all of us have protocols and regulations because I have negotiated quite a few agreements with our partners. And I know that there are certain regulations that limit you, uh, your role or your interventions. But I am glad that the commander, when he was talking, he talked about 360 degrees of involvement. And what I really want to bring to the table is that our training, and I'm glad there are so many naval people who will talk about the military aspect of the training, but I now want to bring to the table and for consideration of uh, the hub that the most important training, and that is why even we as African Union uh, with the AIMS 2050, we are now even writing some annexes and these annexes are introducing economic development. I must admit, maybe it was not there in the first instance because of this over concentration on a military uh, aspect. Of course, insecurity is everybody, everybody's concern. But when we look at what, he, uh, what the general calls uh, the 360, or what we like to call the broader definition of security or human security, I think it is time that we now look at how. And, and NATO and its member states have quite a lot of um, technology to transfer have quite a lot of um, investments. I mean, quite knowledge and capacity to build in maritime governance, science and technology, transfer of technology in areas of um, education, uh, research and innovation, and in areas of, you know, the industry, the maritime industry itself. And why am I saying all of that? Because uh, the outcome really will be a win-win situation because with job creation, for instance, and I like to talk about the community, when you have educated um, community, border, border coastal community, when you have professional personnel in the maritime industry, the investment that our partners will come and do will create job. And uh, of course, it's simplistic to say, that with job creation, you are likely to, uh, it costs you less than the maritime presence, than uh, interdictions and so on and so forth. So what I really want to bring to the table, Ian, is, is that I, I think that education and I think that the hope and I think that NATO should look now, especially with um, all of us trying to recover after, uh, I mean, in the post-COVID uh, uh, pandemic, I, I think that it's good that we look at how we can improve um, the economic. It makes economic sense if the industry, everybody wins, I think. So in addition to doing all the hardcore military safety and security. I think that it is time that we concentrate on education for the non-military aspect. I think I want to stop. I have a few recommendations that have to do with um, cooperation, AU NATO cooperation, and some of the things that we as, uh, as AU uh, areas of communication and areas that we can build more existing. But I think that if I have an opportunity to come back, I'll talk about that. But before I finish, I, I have some colleagues. So I brought in some, um, I, I brought in some help. <laughs> I, I'm not necessarily in the AU. I'm not necessarily the one who knows. I am probably the one who escalate. So I have with me colleagues, I have a colleague from the Peace and Security Department, uh, Mr. Bam, wh whom I'm sure many of our NATO colleagues probably know. He is in charge of our peace uh, support operation, where is, which is a key uh, area of agreement uh, and key area of support that we get from, from NATO. I also have a colleague who is from the legal uh, department of the AU, 
uh, who is in charge of the agreements, its implementation, and so on and so forth. So during the discussions, if we need to go into deep uh, um, assessment of the relationship, uh, I, I hope that you'll be able to call on them to say a few things. Thank you so much. And uh, I, I think you're- you, you, risk, you risk by asking me to speak first. So I hope I have not- <laughs> yeah, The risk I'm always happy to take. Um, I, I think you have I've really uh, hit on something that is very important to remember, which is that the, uh, the purpose of maritime security is always to secure the maritime domain for the enrichment and betterment of life on land. Um, and, and recognizing the nexus between security, governance, and development, as you say, is critical to putting uh, the, the political will behind actually resolving the maritime security challenges. So recognizing the importance of the maritime domain to life on land is, is crucial. And as I always am fond to say, and I, I think uh, Phil Heil may be on, uh, on with us, who is uh, often one to repeat this as well, no shipping, no shopping. Uh, and I like to add no fish, no food, um, and uh, no cables, no communication. And, and the maritime space is critical to life on land. So I think you've done very well to, to emphasize how much we need to not only stamp out the bad, but build up the good at the same time. So that uh, the, the absence of bad uh, actors is not uh, the end of the story, the presence of good actors uh, making economic uh, progress towards uh, a better life on land is, is part of the goal. So thank you very much. Uh, and we will definitely come back to you for, for the cooperation uh, remarks as, as we move along. Now I'm delighted to introduce my, my good friend, uh, Rear Admiral Boniface Conan. This is the first time I've been able to introduce him as an Admiral, uh, as he was recently promoted in the Ivorian Navy and congratulations to him. I believe he's wearing his new rank today. Uh, he is uh, not only an Admiral in the Ivorian Navy, he is the acting director and has been for several years of Cresmeo, the West African Maritime Security Center. In that role, he is responsible for overseeing uh, the development and coordination between zones E, F, and G. Uh, and he has done tremendous work to help fill out and, and really build and promote the uh, security cooperation architecture under the Yaoundé Code. So Admiral Conan, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I believe you are still muted, Admiral. Okay. Do you now hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Uh, I will uh, first begin by uh, greeting the officials uh, because we are in the regional and uh, serving the uh, the Rex, the Regional Economic Community of uh, uh, ECOWAS. So I need to greet my higher boss for now, which is AU official in, in this, on, this, uh, on this panel. Uh, and I will uh, greet the generals, admirals of, uh, uh, of the NATO South Hub and uh, Three Stone International and thank them for the opportunity for a uh, dialogue on the cornerstone matter of training and education to support maritime security in the Gulf of Guinea uh, and the broad Atlantic Africa. Uh, I will greet all the participants and uh, hopefully uh, what we are going to deliver now will help uh, push further in the action we need to take uh, for better security. I heard in the introduction that we are now ranking the most dangerous place uh, maritime place in on earth. Uh, yes, that's where we are going to find good solutions also uh, for security on maritime on earth. And we are, uh, we are trying all the, the way to get there. Uh, Jan, you asked me to concentrate on uh, the operational perspective and how we can make the region strategic vision a reality through exercises. Uh, this is a very good question, and I was expecting, uh, uh, I'm not sure if we are going to have uh, uh, Atachi, uh, uh, Captain Atachi on this board uh, for now since it, there was a, a, a little chief, uh, but the documents are there. Uh, 
the YAMS have been working closely with uh, uh, the supporting organization like uh, UNODC, uh, Interpol, and all of the goodwills uh, working on the training metrics uh, for let, the region. Let me, and, uh, let me, let me interrupt you. All of these informations. Amor, let me interrupt you, if I can. Yeah. Can you just say what the YAMS are? Because I'm not sure everyone's familiar with okay. the acronym. <laughs> okay. <laughs> The YAMS is something we can eat, but uh, here it's uh, the Yaoundé Architecture for Part-Time Security. Uh, this is the acronym we use uh, to depict uh, what Yan, uh, Yan Rabi have been talking about earlier. Uh, and he did a great job presenting the YAMS, so I, I was like, oh, everybody knows it, but uh, thank you again for reminding me. Uh, and then the, this architecture, you have the ICC, uh, in Yaoundé, and then you have the two regional centers, Cresmac and Cresmao, and I'm the leader of Cresmao for now. Actually, I'm the acting director, and I've been acting director for more than four years now. So, uh, about the current exercises in the region, you know, Jan, sometimes we, we don't talk a lot about what is going on inside the countries. Uh, let me bring you back to national exercises conducted continuously by countries. And I will point out one of them, uh, testing yearly and every, or every two years, the interagency platforms. Uh, we can talk about the Senegalese Samarex. Samarex is an exercise bringing on the ground and on water, all of the administrations and agencies working at sea in Senegal. This is a, a, a good example to, to um, reassure uh, our, our boss from uh, AU, uh, Madam, that countries are working already on the 360 interagency effort to, uh, to secure the, the uh, maritime platform. So this is Samarex. And also you have bilateral exercises like Junction Rain conducted with uh, uh, the US Navy, which is not completely an exercise. It's called an operation, but it's conducted after some exercises and it's proven, it's proven to be a good exercise at sea with results on the ground. Because actually uh, navies go there at sea with the help of the uh, uh, US Navy and they capture uh, uh, real uh, criminals, uh, especially the criminals uh, uh, against fisheries. So these are some kind of exercises that have been conducted in Cote d'Ivoire, in Ghana and other countries around, around the Gulf of Guinea. And they are proven to be good. And then you have the large spectrum exercises both geographically and thematically. Uh, I will name Grand African Nemo with the uh, French Navy and Obangame Express with the uh, uh, US Navy. Uh, Obangame Express will be at his, I think, the 10th uh, session this year. And uh, Grand African Nemo will be at the fourth uh, exercise this year. They both demonstrate the eagerness of the uh, professionals person of a region. When I say professional is again to say that at the country's level, agencies like fisheries are interested in these exercises and they take part actually in the exercises at the country level. There are right now the main rendezvous every year for the navies and they will be more and more valuable as a state will adhere uh, the more seagoing vessels, because you know that we are building up the country's capac capabilities and capacities and while doing the exercise. And I think the, the exercises are a very good way to know the real needs of a country in the area of security and the, uh, the good lengths they have to go to build, to conduct maritime security at the, uh, on the broader scale. Let me take an example. Uh, after Obangame, uh, was it the, the 18 or 19, they conducted, real, uh, they conducted mock trials 
after the Obangame exercises, they conducted mock trials in the jurisdictions uh, in five different uh, countries to make the link between the military or the security personnel and the judiciary personnel. So this is a very good example of showing the way our countries are thinking uh, of uh, interagency coordination and cooperation. But now we are looking for more collectiveness. I mean, we have been proving it to be good uh, because the, the, the organizers will come and engage with each country as they go along. Now we are looking for more collectiveness when we we'll have the, the zones working together at sea. And this will happen when the construction of the yams is completed and the centers are operational from national to regional level. The good thing about this exercise is that they established a dialogue between the navies of Atlantic Africa. And I say Atlantic Africa because in, during these exercises, it's not only the Gulf of Guinea, it's the Gulf of Guinea plus uh, uh, Mauritania and uh, uh, Morocco and down to South Africa when they can, uh, they can bring in uh, some uh, assets. The way forward for this explication uh, for these exercises will be the implication of the centers in the planning process more, I mean, right now we are doing the, the, the planning together, but we need the centers to be uh, going through proper partnership and ownership and taking more responsibility. And this year, the good, uh, the good news is that France will be conducting the, uh, the, pre the preparatory uh, meetings from Cresmao and from Cresmac. I think this is a good way we are going. The second point was uh, the, about the concept of permanent exercise. Uh, Dr. Ian Raldi, what I think is that we need to go through training cheaper as a cost, but not cheap, training cheap. I don't know if I'm putting it well in English, but we don't need cheap training, but we need to train with the assets we have. And when we do so, we can do the training every day, every time around the, the year. And the, the big rendezvous with Obangame and, uh, uh, and uh, Nemo will be the, the time we pull these exercises together. So we need to train the operators. And the Navy personnel, they know that they train every day on a ship. So we need to do the same around the Yande architecture for maritime security. This is also cost effective because you, know, you, you use the, the, the assets you have every day for your work. Uh, you know that, I mean, you have been uh, during, the, the, uh, during the, prepar the preparation of different exercises, you hear around the, this area, people talking about fuel, talking about how they are going to support the personnel, how they are going to send liaison officers abroad. This is a lot of money. But remember, since COVID-19 COVID arrived, we are trading cheap. We are just using internet. There is a cost to internet, but we are not flying uh, from a place to another and we are getting the results anyway. I'm not saying that we can do uh, patrolling using internet, but we can train using these assets uh, for the better. And the third question you asked was the ways NATO could help with operat uh, operationalizing the Yande architecture. Yet I'm not going to use our favorite acronym today <laughs> because we have diplomats around, but. The first thing I, I, I see here is uh, uh, generally when we talk with partners, we realize that they don't really understand the, the YAMS, how it is built and the different missions of the centers. And I think that the first point to help a construction 
is to understand what is needed first. So we need to inform, uh, to make sure that the centers are well understood in the way that they are, they are supposed to be uh, op uh, operating before we have building them. Uh, to say something, generally, uh, our partners will en engage us asking if we could do, I mean, uh, if we can go on operations with them as a center. And we'll tell them that it's not our role. Our role is to coordinate the assets the countries are going to pull together and go at sea together at sea uh, uh, for operations. So we, we don't own, uh, the, the centers don't own the equipment, they don't own the assets, they coordinate. And uh, for now, you, you heard about the MOUs between the, the different zone E and F, and we are, we are getting there and hopefully this year, will be conducting the first patrols, I hope, before I leave uh, my, uh, my uh, office. And the second thing is the way they can urge our regional states and organization for action to be taken. And I'm happy that our representative from AU is here. And uh, we, we were talking about going all the way to AU to talk about that because we need our, our big bosses like AU to help, to help uh, different countries understand that we need to move very fast uh, if we don't want somebody else to come and do the job for us. The third point is about the allocation of contribution and support. When I talk with our partners, generally, I see that they are, they are trying to find out where is the money going? They, they will tell us that they are, pull, they are putting a lot of money in the area and we, are, we still have insecurity at sea. So they are, they are saying, does it work or is it not working? Where is the money going? And I will tell them, you need to make sure that you put the money to the right place. And then that you ask for uh, accountability where you put the money. And if you are going to support a, a, an organization, please try to help and build this organization first. Because otherwise, uh, until Cresmao is manned, fully manned and working as a regional organization, because for now it's only Ivorian staff conducting, uh, working as an interimary team. Until you have this, uh, it's very hard to support it because you don't have all of the countries, the member states of uh, ECOWAS inside. And hopefully by end of this term, we should have people, and uh, Captain Tuku will tell you, we should have people joining the center. We all already have uh, one official from uh, uh, Niger aboard. And a good news also is that Zon G has already uh, a director from uh, Senegal and he, he, has, he, he took office already. So we have good news also. The last thing I would like, this is a, a thing we are doing. The, the, we have ship, ride, ship riders programs with our partners. I will es I will expect to have something like staff exchanges program between the centers. We need to be able to send people around the island of Africa. We need to send people in the fusion center in Madagascar, for example, or to send uh, lawyers to Seychelles where uh, first uh, judiciary, I mean, uh, suits were, 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 were done uh, against piracy. So these are some ideas on how we can best support uh, our, our centers uh, on training and uh, education. Because we need, after all, to build a real culture of the maritime and the way the uh, uh, 
the, our diplomat in chief from uh, uh, AU said it, we need our people to think not only the, uh, about sea as a, a threat, but also as a way to produce uh, we uh, wealth and uh, for the better of the populations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Admiral. And I, I think that that notion of creating a maritime culture is, um, it's hard to see from outside, but it is evident having been involved with the region for years. And even as the situation on the water gets worse, um, there is a, a growing momentum behind uh, the professionals working together on land. And I think uh, you, have, you have emphasized that very well. Uh, turning now to another one of those uh, professionals, I'm delighted to introduce my, my dear friend uh, and, and close legal colleague, uh, Captain Dr. Uh, Kamal Din Ali. Uh, Kamal is uh, not only one of the best maritime lawyers on the continent of Africa, but indeed in the world. He holds a PhD from the University of Wollongong in international maritime law. Uh, his 2015 book published with Brill, uh, Maritime Security Cooperation in the Gulf of Guinea, Prospects and Challenges, is one of the most uh, definitive works on the, the state of, of cooperative mechanisms in the region. Uh, and his experience, both as the former director of uh, studies at the Ghana Armed Forces Higher Command Staff College, and now as the director of a uh, West African NGO, SEMLAWS, the Center for Maritime Law and Security in Africa, uh, is a fantastic background for, for engaging in this conversation. And indeed, he was advisor uh, to uh, ICC, to the Interna Interregional Coordination Center, uh, on training for a number of years, working alongside uh, Derek Atachi, who was mentioned uh, just a little while ago. So Kamal, uh, the floor is yours to talk to us a little bit about the importance of, of both legal education and training and how to integrate that into uh, both uh, the, the wider a maritime understanding of the region and the exercises that are conducted. So Kamal, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Anne, for the kind introduction and the kind words. And i um, delighted to be on this panel with colleagues and seniors. Um, so what I intend to do is to quickly share my thoughts uh, more in the context of uh, uh, bullet points and then to uh, wait for the much more extensive interactive section. Um, so I think the first key thing to consider is um, what are the key elements of, of a good training? Um, what should be the key elements of a good training? And, and a, a couple of um, uh, ways uh, comes into mind. Um, one is that uh, it has to be focused, but it has to also be broad. Uh, focus in the sense that we have to identify the training needs, the areas, but it has to be broad because as Her Excellency Ambassador um, to, uh, 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 told us, it has to be broad in such a way that it cover uh, just not the health security issues, but it cover other important dimensions across the maritime uh, uh, governance spectrum. So it has to be focused and it has to be broad. It has to be cost effective. And this may require us bringing training to the people and then making sure that we make good use of the numbers. Um, Gulf of Guinea countries have organized themselves now within this structure that we are discussing. So within that structure, we can make training more, much more cost effective and make it more efficient. It has to be results oriented, which means we identify um, where we have existing gaps and make sure that our training is tailored. But two or three more requirements are equally important. One, it has to be endearing, and I couple that word also with sustain, uh, with uh, being sustainable. Um, when we have training that is endearing, which means that we'll have to retrain and retrain. The reality is that if you look at uh, government architecture through to the enforcement and at the technical level, People do change a lot, and it is just not, it is just the case. It is just the case that if you went back to every Navy or every Marine police um, five years down the lane, you realize that those that were involved in something are no longer in place. So we have to make it endearing, but we have to make it uh, sustainable. And finally, we have to coordinate the training and make it graduated and so that it can have long lasting effect. If this is the case, um, which areas do we? 
uh, look at having training. And here training, but I also looking at it broadly beyond training. One, we need strategic engagements at the highest level. Uh, the truth is that uh, there is high awareness of maritime issues across the continent, but it is also important that we engage strategically to define the training opportunities and the training needs. So when we engage at that level, then it is, it, it is important. We need senior level um, awareness and if you want ambassador training, you know, senior level people who must deepen their awareness, but who will be ambassadors when it comes to training. We need it at the operational level and um, Admiral Conam has covered that a lot, but we also need it at the tactical level where interdiction, boarding and other things will take place. And more importantly, which is uh, a, a greater part of what I am actually talk on, um, we need it at the law enforcement level. At the law enforcement level, again, we need it at the starting from the bottom at the tactical level. It is at the tactical level that interdiction takes place. And whether we like it or not, the interdiction must be conducted in accordance with international law, but it must also be conducted in accordance with national law. Um, we can have as many issues of piracy as possible, but if, for example, Ghana Navy were to send a ship to sea and they conduct an inter interdiction um, um, against a, a flag vessel of Panama, for example, uh, with countries, um, citizens of five other countries on board, if that interdiction is not conducted professionally and in accordance with international law, it will be a problem and it will be counterproductive. Then we need operational level training where uh, legal uh, instruments are reduced into operational language. Um, when you come to the level of dealing with navies, marine police, uh, they don't really put articles based upon who they undertake training. They do that on the basis of SOPs. So you need to reduce the legal language when it comes to legal training into SOPs that come handy, that convey the message that is needed and that becomes um, uh, an effective tool for, for legal interdiction. And then you need evidence collection, you need evidence processing, which, which all forms part of the legal spectrum. And more importantly, you need to train prosecutors so that they can have the capacity to um, ensure what we call legal finish, which is what we've all been discussing. And this is extremely important because at the end of the day, a piracy case will end in court. And if it ends in a, in a court for prosecution, you must have the right people to undertake the, the, the interdiction uh, for uh, the, uh, the prosecution. So what do we have parental as strengths when it comes to legal training? Uh, first is the YAMS, that we have the Yaoundé architecture, and within the Yaoundé architecture, it can be used and it should be used as a pivot for training. The second is that some work has been done in this area already extensively, including the training matrix that has been developed by the ICC um, with the UNODC, but also independent work that has also been taken undertaken, for example, by Gorgin. Um, it is important for us to pull all this together. And what we need as a basis for training already exists. We just need to make sure that we implement that and operationalize that. And that training cuts across, including legal training. There are international partnership and experiences have already been built from UNODC to Interpol to country level training, uh, for example, by the US or by Denmark. Look very important lessons have been built and people have been involved in this already. So these partnerships needs to be leveraged and that is part of the, the strength that we have. Um, what are the challenges that we need to overcome? We need to overcome um, gaps in coordination training, legal training, but all other training. We need to synchronize them more and make sure that the training that we are delivering now will have the best and the highest effect. Funding is a challenge because most training is externally driven. And this is one of the, uh, the, the biggest problem of Gulf of Guinea country and African countries. We need to push more and make sure that our countries present something for training. We cannot continue to say that we want to secure our maritime domain and yet have zero budget or very little budget 
for, for, for training. So we need to dedicate some resources for training so that partners can then see effort and partners can also uh, uh, support that. But when it comes to partners, as Kona mentioned, it is important that when we come in to tra do training, we undertake the training with the people in, in mind. So the people will identify what they really need. And this is why I go back to a Yaoundé architecture and say that enough has been done and we need to build up on that. I know there may be some people who will be asking some key questions that training has been going on all this while. Is it still really relevant? I would say it is more than, re it is more than relevant. In the short time that I spent in the Navy, which is 20 years, I've seen where we were when it comes to training. The Navy was very efficient at tactical training and at be, being at sea, but I've seen other levels of training, especially law enforcement that has come in, that has uplifted the Navy from where it is and many other countries. But importantly, there's still a lot that we need to do. Take, for example, the prosecution and um, law enforcement office in Ghana, that is the uh, Minister of Justice and Attorney General. Uh, we, it is, uh, except the, the, the few, uh, uh, days of training that has been delivered by UNODC, for example, you do not have anybody who is specialized in maritime law at the prosecution division of, of Ghana, up to date. Um, there are a few that have done maritime law, but that is at the civil side. Um, but that shows you the importance of, uh, of still uh, scaling up this training and not to suggest that training is no longer needed. It is more than ever needed. And only a couple of um, time, and a couple of times, I've had, for example, colleagues from uh, Cote d'Ivoire, um, Charles, um, uh, Captain Bell, contacting me. How do we get our Navy officers trained in such a way that they have the capacity, you know, long-term capacity, not the three days training? They should have the long-term capacity. Again, this shows that training is is indeed needed, and we need to spend more time um, gelling up what countries can do and their needs using the ICC and the Yaoundé architecture as a, as a pivot, and then um, enlisting partnerships and, 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 and uh, regional organizations and continental organizations in providing a training that will be enduring and that will be cost effective and sustainable. So this is where I'll put it. And I look forward to the uh, session. And if there are uh, questions directed at me or other colleagues that I can support, I'll more than be happy to, to answer that. Kamal, you never disappoint. You certainly did not today. That was an incredibly clear and, and cogent uh, explication of exactly what is needed. And I, I, I think uh, you've spoken to incredibly important points, one of which that I, I think needs to be emphasized, which is that there is an architecture to work with. Let's work through that architecture uh, to accomplish, not, not work at cross purposes. Um, I'm now delighted to introduce uh, Mr. Bud Dar. Um, Bud is the Executive Vice President for Maritime Policy and Government Affairs at MSC Group. MSC is uh, the second largest shipping line in the world uh, and an incredibly important actor in maritime commerce in the Gulf of Guinea. Uh, as I said earlier, no shipping, no shopping, uh, and Bud is able to speak to that quite, quite directly. Um, he, however, has a very diverse background that gives him a, 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 a gravity in this conversation that is, I think, quite important in that he has spent time in the U.S. Navy, uh, the Merchant Marine, and the Coast Guard. And uh, having seen the maritime space from the, the military side, the commercial side as a merchant mariner, and now uh, as a, an official within the um, uh, the shipping industry. I think he brings a lot to bear on, on how to approach the situation. So, Bud, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Ian, and it's it's really my pleasure to to be here today, and my my honor to to speak among this uh, esteemed group of of other panelists. And I'd like to offer a, a few thoughts, um, partially based from my background, uh, particularly in the U.S. Coast Guard. Uh, during that time, I was very actively involved in the piracy situation off the Horn of Africa, uh, which has some similarities and some distinct differences, um, but I think those lessons are very valuable. But also from uh, my current experience as well uh, with, uh, with the MSC group, uh, which does have a very large presence in the region, and that presence is driven uh, by economic needs of the region. We're there to facilitate commerce. Our entire business is about 
helping trade move. Um, and so I think it's it, it, it's it's important to understand that's why we're there in the first place and it's kind of a given. But I'm not here today because of the economic arguments. I, th I think everyone that participates in an event like this is sophisticated enough to know that the security situation can put uh, the economic circumstances in the region very much in, in peril, if, if not maintained properly. And I'll leave it at that. What really brings me here today is that piracy in particular, and that's what I'm going to focus on, although I have some experience in some of these other areas too, uh, is, is a crime that is not to be talked about in the abstract. For the victims of piracy, and I'm not talking about the companies. I mean, we're collateral victims. The victims are innocent seafarers who are just doing their job every day. And their job is of great benefit to the region or they wouldn't be there in the first place. And to be violently attacked, ripped from their ships, terrorized, um, at times severely injured in a physical and or psychological way. And in some cases, as we've seen as recently as last month, deaths result from that. This is a humanitarian crisis that we just can't stand by and let happen. And it's a hard truth because I know people that participate in an event like this, they're really committed to doing the right things. I, I get that and I empathize with it, but what we're doing now isn't working. These attacks are still occurring at an alarming frequency. Um, the numbers that I believe say there were 130 kidnappings in the Gulf of Guinea in, in the year of 2020, and it looks like we're off to a banner year start for 2021. Unfortunately, my company has been directly involved, unfortunately, um, <laughs> regrettably, uh, with people we care deeply about. We're a family-owned company. We feel it very personally when people in our family are hurt. And that's exactly the way these incidents felt to us. And we wanna do everything we can to try and do as the IMO Secretary General called for yesterday in his declaration of 2021 being the year of action for seafarers to do that and to work collectively and collaboratively to take action because rhetoric just isn't gonna cut it. And ad hoc band-aids on the problem isn't going to cut it. We have to do something more effective. We have to do it together. And you have my assurance, and I can't speak for the whole maritime industry, but I know I can speak for the major container liner operators because we are in very close alignment and, and trying to work together that we're happy to, to cooperate, uh, interact with you, whether it's this type of a forum or informally, so that you can understand how it is we operate, what we're actually experiencing on the water. But what I can tell you is what we are experiencing on the water is a situation that is deteriorating. It's not getting better. And these innocent seafarers are in harm's way. And we're trying everything we can possibly do to try and change that. And I'd like to talk about a couple of the comments that were made. And, and um, I think it's really important that when we think of piracy uh, or armed robbery at sea, which is a close cousin to piracy, but usually for a technicality, um, the acts are, are legally treated differently, but they're pretty much the same piratical acts, if you will, um, are, are a symptom of what's happening ashore. And that has been true pretty much from the dawn of piracy, uh, which goes back a very long time. And, and it was true in Somalia, it's true in the Strait of Malacca. It's the spillover of lack of rule of order ashore and criminal enterprises that are allowed to operate ashore without disruption onto just a target of opportunity, which as I think everyone in, in, in this event knows, you know, has evolved. I mean, we, we, we've all watched before our very eyes uh, for it being more like simple robbery, um, violent as it may have been, um, robbery of things on board or theft of cargo. And it's now moved squarely into the model of sacrificing human liberty, in some case, human life for profit not for the benefit of people that are out at sea at the time um, conducting the acts, they're part of a much more deeply entrenched criminal enterprise ashore. And I'm, I'm not gonna speak to specific countries one, one way or another in this discussion, but I will say 
um, you don't have to look very far to see where the hub of activity is here and where the focus needs to be on that shore side component. And that's why I think Kamal's comments were particularly poignant. I, when I was working in, in, in this issue on the government side, um, with, with regard to Somali piracy and so immersed in it, I, I feel like Kamal and I could have been could have been brothers, although you know maybe that's a little difficult. I felt that way when I heard him talk because many of the things he was saying were exactly the types of things we were saying um, when I was involved in that when we were developing the Djibouti Code of Conduct uh, to cover East Africa and, and, and that region. And among those is it's not just military capacity building and training. There also needs to be competent law enforcement capacity building and training. And depending on which uh, seagoing force you're talking about, you know, there may be blended authorities, they may be separate authorities, but you have to have the right people with the right authority and the right training to put all this together when you attack the symptom at sea of the actual event occurring. So I think it's it's really important we keep those competencies in mind. And there may be some of these competencies that uh, pure military operators like NATO are best to deliver, but there may be others such as Coast Guards or customs authorities um, ar around the world, UNODC perhaps, that can provide the other piece of that of seagoing law enforcement. Um, but all of that capacity building really matters. But at the end of the day, in, in, in my experience, you will not get a solution to this problem unless you have also provided capacity building ashore to actually disrupt these criminal enterprises, disrupt their money flows particularly, which was kind of an unsung hero in the Somali piracy um, solution set because it was mostly done behind the scenes, but it was extremely effective at disrupting the business model until it just didn't work anymore. It wasn't all just military interdiction because you know, that, that's almost a hopeless uh, fool's errand, if you will, to think you're just gonna solve it with, with military operations. It takes a combination of things. And I do think that naval presence uh, can make a big difference because sometimes even without interdiction, just the deterrent effect of having that capable of a force in the region can make a big difference. They also can facilitate communication between the regional actors and conduct training and capacity building in that regard. And I think that's a common theme I'm, I'm hearing already. And I believe in it very much because if you can't have interoperability and cooperation between the response forces that are actually out there and, and day in, day out, even when the foreign operators may come and go, um, you, you won't be as effective and reach the full potential you could at, at, at deterrence. I'll also say just adding hardware into the equation is not really a solution at all. It, it does very little good. And I had a lot of experience with capacity building in my role with the Coast Guard when I was there. Uh, if it's not accompanied by really meaningful training and ongoing cooperation, um, you won't ever get it to reach its maximum potential. And more often than not, you find the assets ultimately, um, you know, in disrepair and not in the operational state of readiness that they would really need. I'll also say uh, from a legal perspective, a couple of points that are important here. And that is, it's not just the rule of law on land that matters and disrupting the business model, holding people accountable for these violent crimes, prosecuting them and making them pay whatever society thinks is a just punishment for it. But also at sea, respect for the rule of law is important. And I think we need to respect the boundaries of international law that include very different regimes for the territorial sea where it's not piracy if it occurs in the territorial sea and some of the most powerful tools available, such as universal jurisdiction and the right of visit of, of naval operators on uh, piratical acts or suspected piracy activities um, are, are, are somehow taken away if, if rights that are really not attributable beyond the territorial sea are asserted and allowed to be asserted. That's very counterproductive, in my opinion, and we've seen that play out in, in many other regions around the world in other contexts. And then just one other commentary I'll, I'll, I'll add here and, and be happy to uh, turn it over to others, and I look forward to a discussion, is 
the Horn of Africa had a very different setup when it came to governance. In that case with Somalia, which was exclusively um, the, the, the operating base of, of the pirates there, um, there was only the transitional federal government, which was um, from a nominal legal perspective, yes, the government, but from a practical sense, really had no capability to act like a sovereign government. And that allowed you know, certain liberties that otherwise are reserved for a sovereign state to be, you know, taken up by and the gap filled by outside operators. That's not the case in, in the Gulf of Guinea region. We have real legitimate states with actual capability in all of these areas I talked about. They need help improving, but they wouldn't expect to be overrun by that. Um, and they shouldn't. They should instead welcome those that are willing to provide assistance both in the case of um, force generation for naval forces, but more importantly, the capacity building that goes with that, and this very important element of capacity building ashore to conduct the root cause law enforcement that needs to accompany that. And these things can complement each other when done in the right way, and if there is a respectful relationship for sovereignty, as well as an open acknowledgement of this is a serious humanitarian problem that needs to be solved. Real lives are being lost. Real lives are being dramatically changed forever by this violence. And we should not sit back and just let this happen. We need to do everything that we possibly can working together. In some cases, that may involve a role for private security uh, as well to fill a breach in, until the situation can really be addressed. And I, I think that uh, I, I would ask an open mind on that if you put yourselves in the shoes of a responsible ship owner that wants to protect their seafarers day to day, which is all we're really trying to do in, in my company. We want to be good partners. We want to cooperate. We want to have mutual understandings and interactions with those of you in a position to help improve the situation. And it's really been my pleasure to be with you here today. So thank you once again. But thank you so much. I think you do such a fantastic job of really underscoring the, the most important issue, which is that ultimately people's lives are at stake. And uh, this is a human issue. This is a humanitarian issue. Um, and any amount of discussion relating to architecture, capacity, capability, authority, jurisdiction, political will is all uh, in, in some way support of saving human life. And, and, and that is a, a critical, critical point. So thank you for underscoring that. Um, and I think it also really highlights that the status quo is untenable. We can't leave it the way it is. And so uh, we continue to look for how to effectively change that status quo uh, using the, the work that has already been done uh, to enhance the, the uh, security and the security cooperation of the region. Uh, to that, I'm delighted to introduce Captain Emmanuel Belbel of the Cameroon Navy, who serves and has been serving for a number of years as the uh, Director of Communication for the Interregional Coordination Center in Yaoundé. Uh, he has been uh, very much a part of the, the regional discussions on how to not only advance security and, and training within the region, uh, but also to coordinate uh, the different international partners who who come into the mix. So uh, while we are uh, starting to run short on time, uh, we want to make sure we hear from from uh, the, the remainder of our speakers. So uh, Captain Belbel, uh, the floor is yours, and um, I look forward to your thoughts on how to, to actually coordinate. Uh, thank you, Jan, uh, for this kind introductions. Uh, I would like to also thank uh, NATO South Hope and uh, Tristone International for inviting me and giving me op the opportunity to speak uh, before this audience. So I have been asked to talk about the challenge of coordinating the needs and interests of partners, including those of NATO, to ensure good training, ex education, and exercise in the Gulf of Guinea. I think before answering this question, uh, allow me to recall the geographical and security context of the Gulf of Guinea. Many people before me have already talked about. I think the Gulf of Guinea, with a coastline of 
36,000 kilometers and an EZ of more than 3.5 million square kilometers with significant mineral and fishing resources are facing multiple attacks despite the measures taken individually and collectively by the coastal state of the Gulf of Guinea. To this security crisis, we have to craft the grid of external countries whose interests and needs are multiple, multifaceted, diverse, and diversified. The Gulf of Guinea state and the structures they have created are therefore at the center of this conjunction of interests, sometimes contradictory and conflicting, that must necessarily be made. This task becomes increasingly, increasingly difficult when it is open necessary to personalize the treatment of each interest or singular need essentially as the partners usually submit them at the same time. For the case that concerns us or the subjects of the question, which relate to training, education and exercises, it should be noted that the partners have each developed their own strategy, which they are coming to carry out in the Gulf of Guinea with the help or not of existing structure. ICC, since its creation and its operationalization in 2017, being the umbrella body of the architecture of Yaoundé has been given the mission of harmonizing training, education, and practice at the interregional level and promoting cooperation with partners in the field of training, education, and practice of maritime professionals during operation and exercises at sea. Internally, that means within the architecture, it is therefore a question of finding a common training base in all the centers of excellence or not in the Gulf of Guinea in order to ensure the same treatment of incidents that occur at sea through standardized and harmonized operating procedures. This work is underway in the centers of excellence across the Gulf of Guinea. This work is done with the help of, of course, of our partners who in other hand often come along with projects already tied up and these projects sometimes does not meet the specific needs of the Yaoundé architecture. Even in this case, the Yaoundé architecture is incorporating them into its calendar to avoid uh, scheduling conflict and duplication of training topics whose consequences are the waste of human finance and time resources, the Yaoundé architecture has succeeded in arranging the partner's exercise. For example, we know that the execution phase of Obangabe Express takes place in March and that of Grand Nemo in October or November each year, to only speak about the interregional exercises. It is the same before the COVID-19 for, the, for their planning phases. For other partners in offering their support, they must take these events into account. I might talk about the Gogin project. I think that started in 2016. I think at the beginning, uh, uh, Gogin uh, used to, to plan uh, its event without taking into account the presence of other 
exercises. I think ICC did a lot to let them take into consideration other, uh, other events. It is not easy on daily, on daily because now uh, that uh, Gogogin is uh, at the end, almost at the end of its project, it is difficult to consign uh, all these uh, agendas. Uh, pre presently, we are in Ghana to attend a, a training. Uh, at the same time, we will we, we are having this uh, event, and I think in March also, uh, along with the Obangabe exhibition phase, Gogin will hold uh, some uh, training because it is. Uh, it can not do otherwise. The project ends at, at, uh, in August. So, another thing is that ICC in partnership with Interpol, UNODC and the US State Department, I think uh, Dr. Kamal mentioned it during his speech, training matrix, which is being implemented yet with the help of the same partners. In a common project like this, the partners fulfill their missions as well, as well as the this is where we allow us to know what is happening at sea by improving the maritime situational awareness. The training of trainer is currently taking place in Accra at the MMCC Zone F headquarters. This training is preparatory to the deployment by next month of some architectural trainers, along with Gogin experts, to centers of the Yaoundé architecture. I have to mention also that the, project, the Gogin project ends, as I said earlier, uh, in August, and nothing is planned by EU for the sustainability of this important tool for the exchange of information at the interregional and international levels. We urge the European Union to find a solution for the survival of Yaris beyond August 2021, like Crimario 2 in the Indian Ocean with Yaris software. It should be noted that we have succeeded with the exercise so far. We have not succeeded with the deployments of ships of the international navies in the Gulf of Guinea to conduct on peer education sessions to the sailor of the coastal countries of the Gulf of Guinea. A few years ago, we, saw, we witnessed stopovers of ships of foreign countries that overlap when they did not follow themselves. The ships of our partners was alongside the peer used to offer the same exercises and the same training sessions on the same topics. The sailors were left with several approaches for the same mission. We use the French, the US, the Danish, the Spanish method, etc. in the face, let's say, of maritime interdiction, maritime operation, uh, VBSS, and so on and so forth. ICC in 2018 asked a country that is at the same time a member of the, e the EU and NATO to coordinate the presence of international navies and their offers in terms of training and practice, which this country has not succeeded to do so far, certainly despite its, its good will. In conclusion, the EU is present in the Gulf of Guinea, the US is present, NATO is shaping up, the countries of both the EU and NATO's uh, and NATO are already here individually. 
each with its own project, its own expectation amid the interests and needs of the Gulf of Guinea. If the ultimate goal is to make the Gulf of Guinea safe and secure, the partners must take into account and work closely with the Yaoundé architecture uh, structures and the coastal country. Thank you for your attention. I am keen to answer the questions within the limits of my knowledge. Thank you so much, Captain Belbel. And uh, I think you've made some incredibly important points and, and touched on uh, some of what was being asked in the uh, the chat relating to the Yaris platform uh, and how that is is uh, unfolding. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, turn now to, to Captain Tukar Mohammed, um, and I hope that he is able to join us. Uh, Captain Mohammed is with uh, the Nigerian Navy, but he is currently uh, operating out of uh, Abuja, where he serves under ECOWAS. Uh, he is part of the, um, uh, the regional uh, security division of ECOWAS, um, headed up by, by Dr. Uh, Dieng of, of uh, Senegal, but uh, he brings a wealth of, of maritime expertise uh, to the role and, and helps to oversee some of the structures and uh, approaches we've been uh, discussing. So um, I'm looking forward to hearing his take on politically, uh, as well as operationally, how NATO can help build the, the, the impetus for engaging in, in greater training, uh, education, and exercising in the region, not just for, for piracy, uh, but across the spectrum of maritime security considerations, including trafficking of drugs, arms, humans, uh, and of course, IUU fishing, which is one of the, uh, the key concerns of, of the region as well. So Captain Tukar Mohammed, uh, I hope you were with us and, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Ian for the kind introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here. And also like to use this opportunity to express my profound appreciation and gratitude to the organizers. Uh, I would like to, much has been said from Admiral Conan Benin and Dr. Kamalu Dean. So I will look at the support from the ECOWAS strategic pillars. Uh, what the first pillar is strengthening maritime governance. So looking at it from policy uh, and the legal, even though over a period, uh, ECOWAS has been engaged with uh, some partners in particular, UNODC, that has uh, provided a, a support in terms of uh, training of lawyers. But however, uh, Dr. Kamaluddin has highlighted, uh, we have a challenge in terms of uh, maritime law specialist within the region. I think it's something NATO could look at. Uh, maritime security and safety from the operations, exercise, and training. And uh, Director Chris Bau has highlighted the rationalization of training needs. Uh, it's a welcome development uh, to come through the political instrument Equals Commission to see what is existing on the ground and what other partners have. The point of entry is through the regional economic communities and the regional mechanisms, in this case, the African Union and the ECOWAS and the partners. The third is a maritime environment after maritime security and safety as the second pillar of the ECOWAS integrated maritime strategy, uh, looking at the environmental pollution and challenges in the providing regulatory frameworks. And this is also another area given the oil spills. And uh, also when you look at uh, issues when you relate to illegal owner of the oil. Captain Mohammed, I think we have lost you. Yes, we'll, we've lost him, we will try to regain. Okay, great. Well, while we um, while we try on that, I'm going to go ahead and, in the interest of time, uh, invite uh, Dr. Ife Okafor Yarwood uh, to help wrap us up in this this discussion before engaging in more of a, a Q and A session. Um, Ife is is 
one of the world's leading experts uh, from both an academic but also a practical sense in understanding uh, the diversity of, of issues that go into maritime insecurity in the Gulf of Guinea. And uh, I, I don't think there's anyone better place to uh, to sum up this, this panel um, by uh, virtue of her position now as a professor at the University of St. Andrews. Uh, so uh, truly an educator uh, and uh, also familiar with uh, the day-to-day -day training, education, and exercising needs of the region. Um, Ife, if you would, please uh, give us your thoughts. Uh, the floor is yours. Um, thank you so much, and I'm so excited to be here. Um, without taking so much of your time, my I was asked to focus my discussion around um, the role of educational institution, both in education and training, and and why their analysis around the situation in the region. And I want to start by saying that absolutely, oh, no. academic okay. institutions. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, great. So thank you so much for having me. Um, I was asked to focus my discussion around the role of education institution, both in education and training in the region. And I want to start by saying that absolutely the education institutions have a central role to play both in training and education because according to Article 14 of the Yaounda Agreement, actually Article 14F is that fostering cooperation among maritime training institutions and, and research centers. And interestingly, we can say from this whole conversation we're having, um, I know that there might not be time to go into contest, but to a point, training is happening. But the research component is actually not happening. And that is something that is very, um, is very worrying, given that how can you actually understand the state or sort of give a holistic picture of a problem in the region if you're not able to engage in research and then understand what the needs are, both training and education needs. Another thing is obviously we talk so much about interregional cooperation and collaboration and, and almost everyone that spoke here have actually talked about it. I enjoyed, I actually um, listened with interest to the conversation or the presentation that was made by by board, and I think that he he made really um, very fascinating point, which is actually very, very accurate. But at the same time, I'd like to say that in the context of really looking at this from a holistic point of view, and if we're talking about maritime security, unless we are changing the general understanding of maritime insecurity to just being all about piracy, and even when we want to do that, and we want to talk about it from the perspective of both economic and personal security and other security issues, I want to say a few things. For example, in comparison, according to a report between 2015 and 2017, um, West African countries lost an estimated um, 717 million to piracy. Obviously, this is it pales into insignificance if we're using the, the economic justification to sort of explain why piracy should be something that we should bring to the fore. Then in comparison, six countries in West Africa lose 2.3 billion each year to illegal fishing. I mean, that is a lot of money, especially when we take into account that obviously we have the um, architecture and we know that government and partners are doing so much to make things happen. But financing or finance, as, as Kamal mentioned, is a problem. So it therefore means that it's practically impossible for us to continue to look at the smart time security situation, even the training needs. Again, I don't want to detract or focusing on training, it's important that we, it should therefore be all about, it's, it should be more integrated. Perhaps there's a role for, for communities to play here. So for instance, even if we decided that, okay, it's going to be about military response and militarization of the oceans, which by the way, sometimes um, affects fishers because you end up seeing that unfortunately, sometimes that they are the victims or they are victimized because they are probably somewhere that they shouldn't be. But if we extend this education and training to communities through sensitization program so that they understand why things are the way they are, why they are not necessarily expected to go to certain areas, you know, no matter your excuse, that going beyond this particular point could mean that you are endangering your life because you could be presented or seen uh, as a pirate or a criminal. At the same time, education and training, because at the end of the day, we understand that 
these criminals or these pirates bring their bounty on land or ashore. We need to sensitize and train local coastal communities and actually make them part of this surveillance, obviously within reason or where reasonably practicable. Because at the end of the day, who is going to tell you where the pirates are housing people? It is going to be the local person, the woman, the man that, that is living around the vicinity that actually feel, well, there is an incentive, not necessarily a monetary incentive, but there is an incentive for me to help um, stem the tide of this problem. And the only way they can understand that incentive is that if they are educated or supported or trained or sensitized to understand that actually addressing this problem is should be a collective thing. Another point that I want to make, and then hopefully I hope we have enough time, and this is in the spirit of continuing with the amazing presentation that was made by, by everyone else, but especially by Ambassador Halima when she talked about the human national or looking at this from the human perspective. I feel that, I mean, almost all the problems of maritime security issues is, is very important for us to address. But I think that actually trying to address this without really ensuring that that interagency or inter um, stakeholders collaboration and cooperation is happening, it's, it's, it's very wrong. And the only way this can happen is for training to, to take place, for, for interagency or agencies to train together to understand what A is doing better than B. And interestingly, this is already happening in silos. So I can, I can give an example of the Fisheries Committee for West Central Gulf of Guinea. Um, they have this um, West African Tax Force on Maritime, um, on Monitoring, Surveillance and Control. And within it, they have um, national working groups. And within the national working groups, they have different agencies, the navies, the Coast Guard, the Port Authorities, the Drug Law Enforcement Agencies coming together, working collectively. And interestingly, there are actually evidence of really good results, fisheries crime being, being tried, evidence collected together, you know, for, for agencies that do not have the capacity to interdict working with the Navy to sort of identify some of the, the strategies of this fisheries crime, outside piracy, really working collectively. But the fact that we do not, I guess, even though that um, the agreement have mandated for this, this is not really happening at the, at the regional level, means that the D component of Article 14, which says exchange of views of maritime issues is not necessarily happening collectively because people can then be able to share best practices. You know, this is what we've done differently. This is what is happening differently. I and mean, if we have a focal point where they can collect this information and, and speaking in one voice, we can avoid replication or duplication. We can avoid waste of time, waste of resources, and actually make sure that the training needs that is given is basically what is needed. I want to conclude by reiterating something. So when I was invited for this, I decided to do my own small research, talk to different agencies in the region to see, so how is this collaboration working? How, what do you think about ABC? And I'm going to read an excerpt without obviously saying who told me this. When I talked about, what do you think about research? And actually this whole idea of maritime security in the region. And the, the person said, and I, I want to quote, he said, research is always neglected, no matter the rhetoric because security services, for example, would say, we know what the problems are, give us the money and the resources, right? And then for the policymakers, they often rather there is less knowledge of a problem because that might also expose their complicity, their ineffectiveness. And in a nutshell, coming back to the point that Captain Belleville made about fund and I, I hope that, that was you, about fund and ensuring that the fund is going to the right place. You can spend, I'm talking to the partners now, you can spend two billion every year without research to actually understand what the problem is. You are literally wasting your money. And this is not even about appropriation of your money or your fund, but because you're bringing money when you've not actually understood the situation, you're basically investing it in the wrong place. So in a nutshell, the training should actually involve the communities. These are already happening in places like Ghana, where actually community members are now contributing data, especially in relation to legal fishing. But if we have a focal point, they would have a place to actually come and share their knowledge. And this can be replicated in other regions. And hopefully, 
in the long run, this would bring about reduce or stem into tight of Paris and the Red Sea, as so many people in the shipping industry are so eager to see happen. Um, thank you so much. Eva, thank you so much. And that that point about research, <clears throat> I think, is is absolutely fantastic. And and if you think about, <clears throat> excuse me, taking a strategic approach to education, training, and exercising. Strategy starts with knowing yourself, knowing your threats, and knowing the terrain um, in, in a very meaningful way. And that research underscores how uh, you, you go about achieving not just the information, but the understanding that can then shape uh, a, a needs-based uh, program uh, that, to, to echo what so many speakers have said, is uh, effective, efficient, and sustainable. Um, so I think uh, you, you've made some really tremendous points there. Um, I uh, believe uh, Captain Tukar Mohammed is is back on, um, and uh, we we are going to bring him yes, into the yeah. conversation. Yes, you're you're here. Can you hear? Me? Yes. Yes. Would you like to, to, to conclude your remarks? Okay. Yes. Thank you very much, Ian. I'm sorry for a uh, had network issues, so I was going to the fourth pillar, optimization of the maritime economy, which borders on the activity regulation and uh, management of commercial ports, transport market conditions. And over a period, we had issues in terms of reporting cases of piracy by the International Maritime Bureau. Even an attempted attack is also uh, looked as a piracy case. From the, uh, my perspective is to use it in order to increase insurance premium. So we should be very open and true real data from the maritime centers that could further provide the positive perspectives. Not at times when the data comes outside of the continent or the subregions, uh, we need to verify the data. So in this regard, uh, NATO will be a critical partner to the entry point of RECs and uh, regional mechanisms in order to provide support. But there should also be clarity, looking at what is on ground, where other training needs are provided uh, through the EU 11th EDF. We have the Regional Maritime University and also the ISMI in Abidjan. So, uh, but we, they are welcome. And also Yaris training is provided, which has been highlighted area, earlier. So looking at, in conclusion, the areas of support, conduct of maritime exercises among and between member states of ECOWAS and ICAS, implementation of joint maritime operations among member states of MCCCs, in particular in zone EF and G, and uh, other activities through a comprehensive maritime security sector reform that will provide education and training needs assessment in the Gulf of Guinea at large we should also leverage on a legal text on harmonized standard operating procedures on arrest detention and the prosecution of arrested persons and vessels in conducting joint maritime operations. So as a way forward in the short period is to engage with ECOWAS through a political dialogue as an entry point within the ECOWAS region and within the continental framework through the Afri African Union in order to support ECOWAS stroke member state maritime security sector reform program and also support member states in adopting and implementing national maritime strategies and also support ECOWAS maritime centers in harmonizing standard operating procedures and rules of engagement and also technology transfer, looking at the satellite imageries, and in conclusion, to take appropriate measures for the follow-up action plan and sustainability strategy. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you so much, Tukar. And um, it, it is, um, I think, really helpful to hear uh, the, the points you made about um, data collection and understanding being headquartered in the region. Um, and that, that is a, <clears throat> a recurring theme in a lot of our discussions about um, where is the data coming from? And I, I know Captain Belbel and others have spoken to uh, the point of, of being frustrated about learning about an incident from somebody uh, in Malaysia 
uh, after it's already occurred, you know, just a few miles uh, off of where you're sitting. And that, that is, uh, I think, a difficulty that needs to be uh, addressed. Um, before we get into that, though, um, it is now time to, to start turning towards uh, Q&A. And for that, I want to invite NATO uh, to uh, pose the, the initial set of questions. Um, we're going to have an opportunity for a, a robust discussion, but also uh, some recommendations. And, and NATO, uh, I think, will kick us off with, uh, with some of the key questions um, that they would like to hear answered. So uh, to, to the hub, over to you. Thank you very much uh, on behalf of the director. And uh, we will uh, not pose so many questions because we need the ground for the audience to, to pose their questions uh, to the panelists. Thank you very much for this very informative session that's really raised the, uh, the awareness that we perceive and the network that we also perceive to get people connected. And we had a, uh, a very good example when uh, Admiral Sir Boniface talked talk with uh, uh, Madam Ambassador about the needs between ECOWAS and uh, African Union. So quick question about uh, standardization and interoperability. Uh, I would like to, to hear from uh, ICC, uh, taking advantage of the opportunities provided by the COVID, how they foresee that, that we can train cheaper getting e-learning and e-training facilities using, of course, cyber resilience uh, in your domain. Do you, do you want to pose a couple of questions and then we can answer them uh, all at once? Or, or do you want to go uh, one by one? No, no. We would like to have people also from the audience posing questions, because if we take all the uh, all the ground, the people in the ground Fantastic. don't have their time. Well, we have we have quite a quite a lot of questions. So um, why don't we start off with that one? Um, because I think that is a, a really key one on, on looking at standards and interoperability. And there there were a couple of comments made about standard operating procedures and harmonization of, of standard operating procedures. Um, so uh, over to the panelists, um, it, it's open for who would like to speak first. And if no one speaks up, I will call on someone. Uh, Admiral Conan, would you would you be willing to, to speak to that since you raised uh, some of those issues right off the bat? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Yamalmi. Um, we uh, in um, in the Ecowas area in the Ecowas region, we decided to approach these questions um, by zones. You know, um, actually you don't get to understand this until you are working together. And uh, we, we, we are doing something with the countries and also a, one of the missions of ICC and the regional centers was to try and get the countries to talk to one person when we are talking about equipment and procedures. And uh, in doing so, if you remember, there was a good job of SOPs, about SOPs uh, done with the uh, uh, US Navy around this area uh, of the Gulf of Guinea in, uh, West, in uh, ECOWAS in the Ecowas region. Uh, you remember one of my favorite uh, challenges I raise when we have this kind of discussion is about language. We are talking about interoperability, but language is about human interoperability. Because for now, generally the operators, the people who are working with the systems, Generally, they get the same stuff from the same market, but the human interoperability is the key. Uh, when we get to that, we, I'm from a French speaking country, but uh, what? Uh, Boniface, you've been muted somehow. Uh, so if you could unmute yourself. 
Somebody doesn't want me to speak. <laughs> okay, what I'm saying is that uh, the, the language problem, the language barrier is a, is a key to, uh, we have to try to, to, to erase this barrier be, uh, to get interoperability of human beings. Because generally the navies and the different administration tend to go to the same, uh, the same companies to get the, the equipment and to get to, uh, and now we are working on same SOPs by, uh, uh, by zones and then this is being worked on. And as I put it, in my early ages until now, what we learned is that there is one maritime language. I, I'm not going to say, it, but myself, I'm from a French-speaking country. And what we say in uh, in Cresmao uh, here is everybody should learn, including the English-speaking countries, should learn at least a second language. Because interoperability for me, it's uh, interoperability of human. Because after that, using the SOPs, using the way we get the equipment. And ICC was trying to get even a way of buying equipment together for a, an economic reason, to make sure that we, we, we address our needs to the same uh, company so that there is a, something to, to gain about the cost. So I think this is a very good uh, question we need to focus on uh, the coming days. Thank, Thank you me. very much. And I, I want to turn uh, the question over to, to Kamal, because I think there's a really important legal issue with this as well. Uh, Admiral Conan has brought up the, the challenge of language, but language also comes with uh, some history that involves different legal systems, not just uh, language of law. So uh, between common law and, and civil law countries, there are different approaches uh, to uh, collecting evidence, to uh, handing it over, to uh, actually developing the, the, the dossier or prosecuting the case. And, and I think that uh, difference needs to be uh, part of, of the thinking on how to uh, ensure interoperability and standards uh, across the region for these law enforcement functions that we were discussing. So Kamal, do you wanna, do you wanna speak to that at all? Because um, you know, there, there is a, a danger of oversimplifying some of the legal education if the, uh, the, the distinctions between those systems aren't, aren't kept in mind. Yes, um, a, a quick one. Thank you, Ayn. Um, there are certainly fundamental differences. And perhaps um, when it comes to criminal uh, jurisprudence and um, fighting crime, um, common law system is so complicated and at times um, uh, self-defeating. Uh, be it as and and can be frustrating up, uh, also to um, to operators, you know, who go to sea or a common law system because it's like you almost do all your best, but what you see staring on your face on a daily basis in the common law system are legal gaps that uh, operators are never able to have in mind when collecting evidence. Be it as it may, um, I think that. Um, uh, the chain of custody in most common law countries is even much longer uh, because ultimately um, the people who collect evidence uh, may never be people who will be at sea to testify to the credibility of that evidence. So it, it makes the issue even much more difficult for, uh, to, to secure prosecution. But what I do know is that um, it's something that we can solve easily. Um, for whether you are dealing with common law or civil law, we have to reduce um, the processes for collecting evidence in the SOPs uh, that work within the particular legal system. And I think this is part of the, the work that, um, the, um, uh, that, that is important to do. Um, you have the, for example, the harmonized, uh, uh, HSOP um, in Nigeria and other countries are developing this will first of all bring in the operators together. But at the level of the police, uh, the level of the Navy, there must be SOPs that tell them what to do and how to hand it over to somebody within the legal system. So they what we will draft, what we will draft and put together as SOP for securing 
and making evidence tight within Nigeria and Ghana will certainly be different from what we'll do for um, Cote d'Ivoire or, or the Republic of Togo. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I think I think there's a, a really important, um, you know, discussion here on both the, the horizontal and vertical uh, s establishment of, of standards, operating procedures, um, and uh, interoperability, both of, of um, equipment, but also human capital. Uh, and that involves uh, the, the, the language issue and the, the legal issue. Um, there's also a question, though, about um, creating standard operating procedures between uh, the navies and coast guards of the region and the industry itself. Um, and so, uh, Bud, I was wondering if you had any thoughts on, on how to uh, achieve a more uh, functional and interoperable uh, uh, approach for the shipping industry uh, to engage with navies so that, that response times are reduced uh, so that clarity is highlighted and that um, ultimately uh, the, the seafarers who are in, uh, in danger uh, are, are the main focus and are looked after as quickly as possible. I think that the number one piece of advice I'd, I'd give on that is settle on an architecture and a single focal point uh, because I've been involved in um, several discussions where um, the reporting lines would be different depending on where you are in the region. And I think that is really just too much to ask in the face of an emergency to make sure you place the right call to the right place at the, at, at the right time. So I think, uh, I, I certainly appreciate why, you know, some would not think ICC is, is, you know, best suited to do that. And, and frankly, I, I think they're better at collecting information than they are communicating with the operators. That's not really their, their core function is I understand why it was set up. Um, maybe as an interim measure, maybe MDAT Gulf of Guinea could be of some assistance um, if it's not to be the actual focal point, uh, but um, that might be a good starting point. And then as confidence and trust is built, not only between the industry and the regional authorities, but also between the regional authorities themselves, maybe we could harmonize that so that there is just one clear central point of contact. We're in the heat of battle, I mean, literally battle. We're dealing with very sophisticated, very professional, violent criminals in, in some of these situations. Um, you, you don't make a mistake. You know exactly who you're supposed to call. You make one call and that information gets delivered to where it's supposed to be delivered. And so I think um, the trick is putting aside, you know, conventional notions of how the architecture is subdivided right now and come together with one common architecture when it comes to actual reporting. You get a much better response from the industry and probably much more consistent and helpful. There also, I'll, I'll point out, I, I believe there's a substantial amount of underreporting of these incidents. And um, we've seen it in other regions too, where, where honestly, if, if, if a report doesn't lead to a reaction, um, the operators tend just to kind of stop reporting. So I think it's really important that we work together to build that, that trust in each other. Uh, we had an incident where naval operator was in close proximity of a ship that was under attack and you know they said uh, we understand your situation we won't be assisting we've notified the authorities ashore um, kind of shocking for our crew didn't really provide a lot of confidence that they would called for help from the right people when frankly I would think they did call for help from who I would think were the right people in the region so we need to work through all that and I think part of that is events like this uh, and other types of engagement where we can meet face to face and, and, and just build trust in each other. I think that point is, is crucial. Um, if you know the person that you're supposed to call, it's a lot easier to, to pick up the phone and call them and they're more likely to actually respond. Uh, and so this, this, um, you know, going to, to captain, uh, to, sorry, uh, Admiral Conan's point, uh, on, uh, on the, the now, uh, more prolific use of technology to, to have engagements. I think the opportunity is there to to create uh, momentum behind building those relationships. And um, uh, there's been a question that's posed to you, Bud. Uh, so I want to turn it right back to you. Um, who is the point of contact for you when when you go? Is there any clear 
uh, protocol or is that always shifting? Um, how are you dealing with that, that sort of confusion? So at present in the region, we've instructed our ships to report to MDAC Gulf of Guinea uh, should they um, ha encounter an incident. Uh, our expectation is that they will immediately liaison with the correct operators in the region. With that being said, I think those of us on the industry side uh, think that we need to work a bit closer with MDAC Gulf of Guinea to make sure they're capable of actually delivering on that. And, and again, they're located outside the region, but if, if we were to pick one central place to call, th those are the instructions we've given at this point. That's very helpful. And I think, you know, just in terms of uh, formulating recommendations, one of the things that, that NATO may be able to help do, um, given its experience with coordinating uh, response between a, a wide uh, number of different countries, different languages, um, is to, to help uh, come up with ways to, to facilitate uh, clearer standard operating procedures for uh, that closing that gap between the industry and um, and, and uh, the navies and reporting centers and architecture of the region, uh, as well as some of these extra regional um, bodies like MDAGOG and IMB uh, and others. So uh, I think that's a, that's a really useful um, uh, point to, to, to make. Um, there have been a lot of questions on IUU fishing, and I want to turn to that because I think it is uh, an incredibly important piece. Um, and this, this actually is not unrelated to piracy uh, as well. If we look at the, the attacks, uh, even just recently uh, off of Gabon, but um, across the region in, in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, in Ghana, in Benin, in Togo, um, the last year has seen a, a rather precipitous rise in attacks on fishing vessels. And so piracy and, and uh, fishing and, and potentially even IUU fishing are starting to intersect. But to move us beyond just talking about piracy, uh, I want to pose a couple of questions uh, about IUU fishing. And the first one is really, how can this same architecture uh, and what we were even just talking about relating to uh, setting up a clearer standard and operating procedures between industry and uh, the region start to, to be used to, to help focus on other issues, but particularly on IUU fishing, which is a threat to the uh, regional communities, the coastal communities uh, and the regional economies, um, which as Bud had said before, um, is where a lot of the, the piracy issues originate. You know, if we, if we take the piracy as a land-based problem with maritime symptoms, um, the economic activity of those who live on land uh, is critical and IUU fishing uh, undermines that as well. So how can we uh, focus a little bit of our attention on uh, leveraging uh, the work that is being done for counter piracy to also uh, deal with counter IUU fishing and maybe uh, close the gap between those two offenses? Um, uh, Ife, do you want to kick us off on that one? Because uh, I, I know that you, you spoke uh, a little bit to, to that already, and I know this is one of your areas of, of passion and expertise. Um, thank you so much for, for the question. I think um, in the spirit of sort of borrowing some of the themes of the things that have already been said, that the only way we can do that is obviously a recognition that the mandate of the armed architecture, for example, is not only Paris and Amarbe at sea. And we see, unfortunately, the way things are implemented presently in terms of the collaboration and the cooperation, it seems to focus solely on that when we know that there are also cooperation and collaboration happening at the national levels around um, navies or other agencies collaborating to sort of stem the tide of, of illegal fishing, for example. And, and personally, I think that for us to be able to get this right, it therefore means that agencies that, is not, that are not the Navy, for example, fisheries department, are also part of the discourse. <laughs> and then it means, therefore, you have you need someone with fisheries expertise in that training and education department. Because again, I, I don't think that um, it is within the remit of any NAVRA agency to actually understand the complexities around fisheries governance. And therefore, you need to ensure that collaboration is actively happening either in the training and education department and also beyond that. Personally, that is the only way I think, based on the research that I do. But of course, I also understand that they, it's going to be, to a point, complex. 
unless we get one thing right. In reality, the issue around Paris and Marbella Sea have not necessarily been gotten right. So trying to then immediately trying to use the same Navy to try to stop issues relating to illegal fishing would make things more complicated. So for example, I think at the introduction, you talked about the, the, the zones that are already operational. Operational, a couple of the zones, the one that is supposed to be situated in, in prayer in, in Cabo Verde is still not um, operational. The one in, in Angola is still not operational. So I think we need to formalize the agreement. You know, what was agreed at in Yaoundé? We need to keep going back to it and, and stop focusing only on Paris and Amorabia Sea. I read the document actually before the, I mean, today's event, just to understand are things adequately accounted for? And interestingly, all this we're talking about now around training and research were stated, were agreed. But then in practice, there's only an aspect of it. So we need to go back to the drawing board. Yes, the region have made an improvement. And, and, and I, I mean, we have to recognize that we are not necessarily where we need to be, but then we're not where we used to be. And so to get things right, we need to go back to what was agreed. Thank you. I that is such a, a critical point. When I when I was at uh, the Africa Center for Strategic Studies, I um, we we had an event and and some of the people on the call uh, were there for it. Where we we created a list of all the instruments and all the institutions on maritime security cooperation in Africa that had been uh, brought up over the years, and um, so many of them had never been formally unwound. Um, they were still there, uh, but they were all sort of really on point. They were enlightened documents. Um, they just had never been implemented. And over time, people had forgotten what was in them. And so going back to, to them, going back to the text, going back to the mandates, uh, I think is really important. And when it comes to, to where we are now, uh, the Yaoundé architecture um, really uh, needs to, to underscore the importance for all partners to look at that, that uh, 2013 Code of Conduct. Uh, and for um, uh, the, the broader context to look at the Africa Integrated Maritime Strategy 2050. And to that, I want to turn to uh, Ambassador Mustafa, um, who had mentioned uh, sort of the, the, the thoughts and recommendations on, on coordination. Um, and I want, to, I want to ask to that, how, how can NATO as a partner and other partners that are, are on this, this call um, be better marshaled into supporting uh, the uh, aims of aims, uh, no, uh, and the the uh, the mandate of the Yaoundé architecture. Um, I, I say that partly in the context of the really robust discussion that that has been happening on the chat uh, relating to both SWAMES and um, uh, which is support to the West African Integrated Maritime Strategy and uh, the Yaris platform, which is the uh, Yaoundé architecture regional information sharing uh, platform. Uh, that, that has been discussed. And so um, in that vein, how can, how can partners like NATO um, become part of the supporting mechanisms for implementing uh, the, the objectives of, of AIMS 2050 and uh, the Yaoundé Code? Ambassador Mustafa? Thank you, um, Ian. Um, I, I think that I would like to start by actually saying that um, it is our responsibility, and we must recognize it as national governments um, in the continent, that is our member states, that the primary responsibility for governance, um, I, I mean, I, I, I take a lot of, uh, I see a lot of the points made by BAD about the industry and so on and so forth. So, I mean, we will be the first persons in the continent to say that the primary responsibility really rests in the African governments. Having said that, um, I also want to say in, relate, in relation to that, I also want to say that uh, we always have very good regulations. We have many protocols as you have mentioned. And I want to say that one of, and the African Union will be the first to admit, one of the, our biggest problems ourselves is that a lot of these have issues with either signing, a lot of people will sign and then ratification and so on and so forth. But of course, now we are seeing that perhaps spending so much time to say that people should ratify is not as important because some countries who have not even ratified some of the protocols, like you're talking about the Yahundi, are actually implementing them. 
I give you an example. One of our biggest things in the African Union is free movement. Um, there are many countries, uh, especially in ECOWAS. In ECOWAS, if you like, is the superstar for free movement. We've been doing that for ages. But there are countries, if you like, who have not really officially ratified, but they are doing this. In terms of what partners can do, and um, that also goes to answer uh, uh, um, Conat's uh, question about the relationship, what as the Secretariat, as the African Union, what are we doing and how are we positioning ourselves to not only coordinate the, the regional uh, groupings, our member state, but also our relationship with partners. And one practical uh, recommendation that I will make, and which is a low hanging, if you like, is a low hanging fruit, is the, in the EMS, we had wanted to put, for instance, dedicating a department a maritime department in the African Union. And what would that do? That would give focus, real focus to the issue of maritime. And the African Union is a gigantic body. And we have the peace and security, we have policy organs like Peace and Security Council, we have all manners of things, but we want it. Unfortunately, right now it is not on the card. So one of the recommendations I really want to make um, for partners and for partners like, um, like NATO is to consider um, sponsoring experts to come. In addition, you know, we have with, the, with NATO, we have a liaison officer um, who is really not, uh, not uh, who is no longer, I think he's been reposted. I think that in addition to the liaison officer, the NATO, NATO liaison officer, perhaps uh, partners like NATO and EU should really consider sending experts that will help establish not a department because it's not happening now and it has to do with uh, this thing. I think that that will help both the member, member countries and also the partners. Another thing that kind of focus would do is the outreach that uh, Dr. Um, uh, FS Sinasi was talking about. The issue of outreach, for us it is very, the blue economy is very important. There are many people who say we just came into it just recently. I mean, that can be, but outreach to different, part, uh, to different communities, to different industries, people like BAD who are in the, in, in the shipping industry, people in the uh, research, people in the oceanographies, the fisheries, and so on and so forth, and including the communities. The communities who, when they are properly engaged, will be the skilled personnel, the skilled maritime personnel that we're talking about. So I, I think that those are two practical things I would, I would, really, I would really recommend. And what would be the outcome for that kind of thing? Partners in the continent need to build trust and confidence. And, and I, when partners are seen, you are talking about illegal fishing, for instance. I mean, there's so many of our partners who have database. There are so many of our partners who have eyes on the sea and they know which trawlers Information sharing, somebody in the chat box talked about intelligence sharing. There are partners in those, uh, in those domain that can really help in, in that, in sharing information data, in trying to, for instance, backlist shipping trawlers that come and, and steal. A lot of our, our countries do not have some of these capacities and some of these uh, uh, capabilities and we can share, that will definitely build confidence with our governments. And of course, uh, partners also can put pressure. I work in government. I will be the first person to say that we are not where we are in terms of implementation and in terms of uh, what 
uh, what was being spoken about offshore that the, 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 the whole law enforcement thing has to start. In fact, one of the one of the problems we have in government is the debate whether or not these criminal enterprises have gone so far that even if you do any interventions, they are <laughs> amenable to change. Whether these criminal enterprises have come and they are trying to survive against you as government. And then you find that some governments now say, well, so it is a security issue, it is a military issue, we have to do the law enforcement. Why on the other side, there's also the community base, you know, providing the good governance, providing the social, uh, providing the opportunity, the job creation for teaming youths, for instance, so that they are not, uh, they are not uh, recruited or they are not uh, taking part in kidnapping, piracy, and, and so on and so forth. So two key things. I think NATO, um, we, we are going to have our military to military conversation with NATO, which we do annually. Unfortunately, we couldn't do it this year. And uh, in terms of what we can do in harmonization of legal, I don't know if we still have time. Our legal counsel is in the call. I don't know if she wants to, if you want to give her half a minute to just say uh, a few things about uh, the problem with member states, the, the issue of harmonization of law. Um, uh, Ambassador Namira, are you still on the call? Yes, I'm still here. Okay, very good. Sorry, Ian, but I, I think no, that- no, Please, uh, Ambassador Namira, it's good to see you. And uh, I- see I, you again. Mustafa, thank you very much. I, I, I welcome Ambassador Namira's comments because I think this, this point of harmonization of, of uh, legal training and legal approaches is incredibly important. So, Madam Ambassador, over to you. Um, thank you so much. Actually, um, thank you, Ambassador Hadisa, and uh, thank you, Ian. When it comes to the issues in relation to the legal training, I would start with that. Um, I do agree with uh, one of the commentators that um, when we are training uh, officials who are in practice, we uh, end up putting them in our legal jargon lost. Uh, this is something we have to uh, take care of um, and adapt our legal trainings to uh, the uh, military officials. Um, the issue of Ambassador Hadisa that, that she raised in relation to our member states um, is true. We have one problem when it comes to the ratification of our documents. Um, we have a lot of programs to try to um, accelerate the ratification. Uh, but again, it's the will of the member states, so it's not uh, something it's in our hands really to, to do, but we are trying to uh, at least uh, encourage member states that they may not know what the benefits of having these documents. Um, the issue of having a maritime department in the African Union, we fought so hard for it um, in the last restructuring of the commission. Uh, because uh, we were actually copying the models of other organizations like um, the UN and others, because uh, I, I'm the legal counsel, so it should be under me, and then everybody has their own uh, piece of the cake, depending on their own uh, portfolios. But member states were inclined only to add the maritime officer uh, uh, in the um, with the blue economy. So, uh, which is, um, I think, it's very minor. Um, we're still handling the strategy, and the strategy, as Ambassador Hadisa said, is already in implementation. But stemming out of this strategy, we have the uh, LOME Charter for Maritime Security, which is still pending the ratifications and the finalization of its annexes. Um, one of the major issues that I have discovered in, in some trainings I have uh, joined uh, with, um, um, in the maritime field uh, is in relation to the capacity itself. And I think this is one of the problems we discover in the Gulf of Guinea. We have this case uh, that was uh, in Itlos uh, between Switzerland and Nigeria for uh, oil traffickers. Um, it shows that it was um, good to have a Navy as big as Nigeria to be able to go in hot pursuit against this vessel. But how many of the countries around the Gulf of Guinea can manage this? Um, we need also to have this kind of capacity on the ground in order to be able to support the um, 
not only the Gulf of Guinea um, member states, but also the Gulf of Guinea um, um, association itself, uh, the organization itself, to be able to implement and carry out its mandate. These are my quick comments. I know you are running out of time and uh, I'll see you again soon. Thank you. Well, thank, you. thank you very much. And I think to that point about the San Padre Pio case, the Switzerland versus Nigeria one, I think one of the important uh, sort of takeaways from looking at all the ITLOS and, and other international tribunal jurisprudence on um, maritime uh, oil related issues, whether it's bunkering operations or ship to ship transfers, it's almost all of them occur in, in West and Central Africa. So if you look at San Padre Pio, the Dues Get Integrity, the Saiga, and uh, the Virginia G, which are all uh, sort of key cases for, for understanding the, the international law around them, they all involve um, questioned steps, whether they were uh, ultimately found to be okay or not um, in, uh, in the, the Gulf of Guinea. And I think that's, that's really important to recognize that having an understanding of those laws before going out and doing interdiction operations uh, is critical to making sure that they are ultimately uh, successful and that uh, the deterrent effect of maritime law enforcement uh, comes in, whether it's in the piracy context, the fishing context, uh, or, or other criminal activities like um, illicit oil-related uh, offenses. Um, and I think, um, I, I think you make some excellent points about uh, how to, to uh, incorporate uh, sort of legal understanding and, in, and instruments into, into training. I want to uh, turn now. Um, this is uh, this is one of the the, the key questions that's been a, a discussion uh, lately, and this goes to um, what Ambassador Hadiza just said uh, as well about uh, liaison officers and that sharing. Um, the EU has launched the coordinated maritime presence, a, a new uh, form of engagement uh, involving uh, the presence of naval vessels in the region. And my question is to uh, really uh, both uh, Captain Belbel and Captain Mohammed on what uh, coordination you are looking for out of that. Um, in other words, how can, can uh, the momentum behind the Coordinated Maritime Presence mission, uh, as well as some of these others like SWAMES and, and uh, the incorporation of the Yaris platform, be leveraged to maximum effect. What is needed? What are the profiles needed for training? What are the personalities needed for liaison officers? How do we um, help facilitate cooperation between Europe, uh, NATO, uh, North America, other partners, uh, and the region in the most effective way possible? So um, Captain Belbel, Captain Mohammed, it's a very broad uh, question. It's actually a set of questions, really. I, I would object to myself if I were in court for asking a compound question. Um, but uh, please, I, I would love your thoughts. Captain Mohammed, uh, to you first. All right, we'll, we'll try for Captain Belbel. Um, Captain Belbel, are you still with us? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Um, Wonderful. I'm still with you. I think you, uh, Jan, you are asking me a very sensitive question. So, because uh, you know that uh, the presence of uh, foreign navies in our region uh, doesn't depend on, let's say, ICC or the regional centers, but uh, also or depend on the approval of the, the coastal countries. I think uh, piracy is a, an international crime. So uh, I think beyond the international waters, uh, it is clear that any uh, ships or belonging to any country can address uh, the, the issues. Uh, yes, you know that the context, because somebody asked the question of if it is valuable to have an operation like Atalant in the Gulf of Guinea. You know, the context here is not the, the same uh, like what is going on of the Horn of Africa. Uh, I think uh, I'm not talking on behalf of the coastal countries of uh, the Gulf of Guinea, but I might suppose that uh, those coastal countries will need 
to be supported instead of uh, giving the responsibility of securing their waters to others. Uh, but uh, I think uh, they are well placed to answer uh, that question. Uh, this being said, uh, at the inter-regional level where I am now, I think uh, we, our ultimate goal, as I said earlier, is to secure the Gulf of Guinea. So any person, any entities that uh, has the same goal is welcome in our area. As I was saying that the contest with Somalia or the Horn of Africa is not uh, the same because here in, in the Gulf of Guinea, when, uh, the, when the maritime insecurity started, uh, I think a few years ago, our head of state and government put in place a, a number of measures. Among them, we have the creation of what we call uh, in, in these days, the YAMS, the Yaoundé Architecture for Maritime Security. I think uh, you talk about uh, that uh, uh, structure a uh, few minutes ago. And we have structure, most of them are fully operational. Uh, some of them are not fully operational. Some others are, are in development. I think uh, the interim director, the acting director of Cresmao announced that, uh, announced a good news that uh, the G, the Zone G, head of the MMCC is, has already been appointed. And I think uh, if he is not in prior, he will be in prior in the forthcoming weeks or months. So uh, we have to call the unit. Uh, I think the first step or the first level is sharing information. Sharing is information is crucial is instrumental because now the Yaoundé architectural structure have not the privilege for the voluntary reporting from the ships at sea. This privilege is meant for MGADGOG and IMB, PRC. How do you want the coastal countries or the navies of the coastal country to act appropriately when there is an incident at team. They are waiting for somebody else to send information that he has received from the ship. So, and when we are, when we are cooperating with what we call with our partners, they will not share information they will not share operational information with us. They will say they will share strategic information. Strategic information will not help to, to what we call, to intercept pirates at sea. So the first thing is information sharing. If, if we have access to information timely in our region, I think we, we will, improve our readiness, we will improve our response. Now, you are talking of the cooperation at sea with foreign navies. So uh, what we call regional navies with foreign navies. Yes, because you know that as the coastal countries have secured, let's say the territorial waters, the anchorage zones, now pirates are going far from the coastline to uh, attack the, the ships. And they know that we don't have capacities to go there to respond when there is an event. Because I think if we have assets, we will, we will spend, let's say, 10 hours to, to 
to reach, let's say, 100 and uh, what we call 150 uh, uh, nautical miles. So I think to summarize, we need them, but they, they have to come and talk with us, negotiate if uh, it is uh, uh, appropriately with us, and to see how we can integrate them in our uh, strategy. Not that somebody is somewhere planning for deployment in our region. Thank you. I, I think I was not too long. No, and I think you make really important points about the, that need for, for true coordination, true cooperation. Uh, and I think you make a very important point as well that in some ways, the complexity of the situation today in terms of where attacks are occurring, uh, the, the brazenness of some of the attacks uh, is in fact a result of the, the risk reward calculus having changed uh, such that pirates can no longer uh, expect to get away with it in, in the territorial sea. They have to attack farther out. They have to make it more uh, difficult. Um, and so they have actually increased or escalated their own approaches in response to the escalation uh, and improvement uh, of maritime law enforcement and security uh, in the near shore areas. So I think, uh, I think you make some really tremendous points there. Now, I, I uh, am very conscious of time, uh, and I want to give all of the speakers a, a final chance to, to offer very brief, very brief recommendations, bullet point recommendations. Um, but uh, I want to, to start off uh, first with Captain uh, Mohammed, because I know he, he did not have a chance to answer that, that last question. So Captain Mohammed, if you can be very brief um, in, in answering that and then provide your recommendation, and then I will go to uh, Kamal and we'll, we'll mix up the order, but uh, please, uh, Captain Mohammed, very briefly. Okay, thank you very much. The point of entry uh, through our strategies from the perspective of ECOWAS and ICAS, uh, rather than creating, is to complement what is on ground and it is believed the support to these maritime centers within the framework short, medium and long-term objectives that is achievable. And uh, very also difficult when it comes to issue of sovereignty, unlike the perspective of piracy, which on clause article 101, 100 and 105 has universal jurisdiction. At least we have tried in Nigeria and Benin, Operation Prosperity has shown a very good working relationship and it is doable, which succeeded in reducing the piracy to the barest minimum. So I still believe we can come in through the strategies and with the support of the member state. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I, I think that's really important. Unfortunately, I am going to uh, contradict my own statement as to who would be going next. Uh, Mr. Bud Dar has a hard stop. So I'm going to uh, offer him uh, a, a moment just to, to give his final recommendation. Uh, Bud, over to you. Uh, thank you. And I appreciate you uh, changing up the order a little to accommodate my schedule. Uh, it's been a real pleasure being here today. Um, recommendations I would give are, first of all, be honest about the problem. Uh, because you can't really uh, undertake true problem solving unless uh, you've had a transparent, honest understanding of what it is. Uh, second is don't just treat the symptoms, treat the cause. And the third is work together and work with external partners uh, to do all of those things. And I again reaffirm my commitment as uh, representative of the container liner industry that we certainly are prepared to do our part to help um, you understand what it is we're seeing and uh, and what sorts of things you might be able to do uh, to help yourselves with this problem in the region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, some very on point recommendations. Kamal, um, I, I now turn to you. I know you wanted to make a comment about uh, the CMP as well. Um, so. Um, please do so briefly and then uh, offer up your recommendations. Yes, um, in the CMP, um, very laudable comments and um, interventions that have been made by Captain Bell and then uh, Mohammed. Um, uh, obviously, these are people that have had long, long experience and commitment in the maritime security architecture of this region, Konam and everybody else. I think in truth, 
one of the things we must admit is that whether we like it or not, we'll continue to have a north-south relationship, we'll continue to have dialogue of who we are and who you are. But we always notice that there are great areas of cooperation uh, and where there are shared interests. One of the greatest things that the Andi architecture was lacking is the issue of confidence building. Uh, confidence building between our partners or between uh, the industry and many countries. And the CMP, whether you like it or not, have deepened or cracked this confidence much, much further. I think that uh, the CMP ought to have been an entry point, you know, within the regional, um, within the Yaoundé architecture and taking into consideration the regional economic communities, but that has not been the case. As somebody mentioned, I have interacted with many people in this Yaoundé architecture in member countries. If you want the Yaoundé architecture to work well, three years, four years into the Yaoundé architecture, here in Accra, there in, uh, in Benin, uh, officers are sitting and sitting in monitoring zone F and zone E 24 hours. Why is it that the shipping industry is still not producing, even just share, check in and share information and say, hey, here am I, I'm passing. You know, I'm part of the reason why you are doing this work. This silence of the Yaoundé architecture uh, coordination where nobody is talking to them until there is a Paris incident and they will have to react. I just don't get it because it doesn't add up. Ships are checking in with that, that is far away, but never prepared to check in and just say, hello, how do you feel if you are sitting at the NMC in zone FOE and you get the captain to say that I am the captain of this ship and I'm just passing through the waters. So in reality, is it because there is lack of confidence in the system to start with? So why are we investing money, EU money, member states money, if ultimately we are not prepared to put in the final base of the of, of the blocks to make sure that there's confidence building. So this already existed, which was a major uh, area, and the CMP has come in, you know, without you know using the, the the existing architecture as an entry point, and this is something that is to be watched. So I would hope that the EU and the key member states of the CMP should look at it and know that this approach is, is self-defeating in a way. We have built the Yaoundé architecture and a lot has been put in by the EU and other countries up to this stage. People should not be frustrated about it. The truth is that we must be able to overcome this piracy threat. The truth is that both of these countries may be doing enough, but the truth is that quite a lot has also been done over the period. Even in NATO, we have uh, challenges. So we should recognize this and then put in the confident building measures and the CMP should be seen as temporary. The gaps already exist in the entry of the CMP and those gaps will have to be addressed. And this will be my recommendation on that. Thank you so much, Kamal. Um, I'm gonna just move rapidly through our speakers. Um, Admiral Boniface Conan, um, your, your uh, 10 second uh, final recommendation. Okay, yeah. Um, I will just say that uh, we need to be, there's a need for coherence. Uh, you cannot judge something you are not helping to build. Uh, a lot have been said already. We want the architecture of Yaoundé, the Yaoundé code of conduct to be working. We need to get inside, know what the mission of the centers are, help them build up, link up with the uh, AU initiative for uh, maritime security around Africa, uh, build all these links together, and then we can talk about cooperation. Because who are we cooperating with? Uh, in a hurry, there is a need for security. Okay, there is a need for ships, uh, and navies in the Gulf of Guinea. But how long do you think this is going to last? So I don't think this is a durable, uh, uh, a durable solution to be talking about joint uh, presence in the Gulf of Guinea because it's, bec it's become the, the, um, the most insecure part of, a, of, a, of 
a, of a globe before by doing so you come in and help build up this architecture and know exactly where you are putting the money. Uh, that's the only word I can say for now. Thank you so much. Um, uh, Ife, um, over to you, your final thoughts on today. Okay, um, thank you so much for that. And thank you for the recommendation so far. It is absolutely apt and I feel that it should be strongly considered. However, for my part, without really regurgitating what has been said already, I would basically say, go back to the drawing board. The agreements highlighted, recognized that these things are needed. It even talked about exchange of views on maritime issues. It talked about sharing curriculum and course information. And so, I mean, to be able to fill the gaps, it means therefore that we have to then remember what was agreed and work with the, the architecture, you know, at the, from the national to the regional level so that they, we can ensure that things are done in line with what the, the different governments have agreed. And I think one of the problems, obviously we've talked about the, the challenges around funding, the challenges around, um, you know, expertise. But at the end of the day, if, if governments or those that sign an agreement see that efforts are made at the national level to actually make sure that the interagency cooperation is working, perhaps it might be an incentive for them to do better. And so for us to ensure that the interagency cooperation and collaboration is working, we then need to extend that by providing necessary training, but also extending the training and sensitization programs or something, education program to the communities because they have an active role to play, especially given that, well, the region lacks the resources. It means that they can get help from whoever. And I feel that the, the community should be central to, to improving and enhancing safety and security in the Gulf of Guinea. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love those points. Um, Captain Belbel, uh, your final, final recommendations? Yes, Jan. Uh, yes, th thank you. I think I would be would be long because uh, recommendations uh, derive from what I've previously uh, said. I think uh, we need um, to sit down with our inter international partners. If I say we, I'm talking of the only architectural. Uh, structure, ICC, the regional centers, the MMCC, and so on, with our international partners. We need to build trust. And after that trust, we will have a lot of, we will put in place an action plan that integrate the Yaoundé architecture missions and our international partners missions. At the end of the day, I think we will achieve the ultimate goal, as I said, secure the Gulf of Guinea. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Ambassador Hadiza, uh, your, your final thoughts. Um, I, I think you are the alpha and the omega of our, uh, of our discussion. Uh, so, so you have the final word on the panel. Thank you for the pressure. <laughs> um, I mean, a lot have been said about building trust and confidence. Uh, and I think that this is very, very important, not only for our relationship or cooperation with uh, our partners, which is very important. There is a lot of understanding transparency that is required on that. And a lot of understanding, like my sister would say, understanding of what the problem is. But I also want to say now, turn the table. Well, now, Ian, you're going to put me in trouble. When I was working for the Nigerian government, I have only one government um, uh, looking for me. Now I have 55 governments. But I must say this, that the trust and confidence must also be built amongst us. Um, there's so much talked about, and there's so many experts from the Yahundi um, architecture, from the regional, from ECOWAS but we also need to enhance our own level of trust. Training, for instance, should be done at entry level. 
not only at the generals or at the uh, at the policy level and strategic level, but down to the operational and tactical level, so that amongst us in the continent, we can also build a lot of trust. Uh, I mean, my, my brother Conan, I keep on going back to him, he spoke about language. Um, you know, the convening power, one of the questions in the survey, it talks about uh, the Anglophone Francophone, the convening power of the African Union, the, the, the fact also that the African Union coordinates things, it's very important and it's supposed to integrate us. So I, I think that we also should try to build uh, uh, confidence. I've seen something in, in the Herbs uh, publication, Gulf of Guinea Regional Dynamics, a, a publication for 20, uh, February 2020, and it made a very good con uh, conclusion for our partners. And that is that, you know, we, we should show understanding and we should encourage maybe rich countries and regional uh, centers, powers, those with, with the capability and the will to do this, uh, this thing. Sometimes we should encourage them instead of only seeing the negative aspects of those kind of things. So understanding, trust, and confidence. Madam Ambassador, thank you so much. I think those are fantastic uh, points. Um, I want to thank the entire panel. This has been a really tremendous discussion. But before I wrap up, um, I want to ask if the, the NATO hub would like to uh, make any final comments or, or, or share any final reflections. NATO hub. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the, the director, everything, a uh, lot of things was being shared. Thank you, Madam Ambassador uh, from the African Union. And this represents uh, all the African uh, friends and brothers that are here. A lot of answers are still to be answered and lots of effort needs to be done. Uh, lots of key takeaways for sure. And we talk about cooperation, coordination uh, and collaboration, these three Cs, but amongst all these three Cs is the communication that encompasses the language, the standardization, the way we build our nar narratives uh, through the young people, the women, the ones that really are engaged in, in some sense with the, the maritime uh, domain, either in Eastern industry, fishing, uh, creating jobs like Madam Ambassador just to reflect. And we know that this COVID brought a lot of pro uh, concerns, uh, reducing the budget for law enforcement, for um, defense budget, uh, exacerbates the social part that will exacerbate also the crime uh, that we need to be prepared to, to tackle, uh, but bring, brought a lot of uh, good opportunities like this one to be, get the people together to speak about this. And we should be proud of ourselves to be here, frankly, building trust among each other to move forward. Uh, like somebody said, we need to align the agenda and take advantage that this is the decade of the ocean uh, to build the ocean culture. Uh, taking advantage, again, I'm using advantage a lot of times to be positive uh, of the existing framework, for example, between NATO and African Union, the so-called LNO that is missing, that the COVID just took it out from uh, uh, Addis uh, for a matter of uh, security. Information sharing. Uh, it's one of our pillars here in the hub and, of course, in, within NATO. Uh, Dr. Kamal talked about synchronization. Uh, we need to understand where to go to this, to this part, piece of synchronization that, for sure, the hub mission as it is, and you can see it in our webpage, is to try to avoid duplications within the allies, within uh, partners, and, of course, start, try to fill the gaps that... Um, we uh, have in our mission as a NATO body. body, body sorry, uh, On the leadership role, there is lots to be done and building platforms with the hub, inviting the hub, inviting NATO uh, and to, to discuss uh, at all levels. And for sure, the political level is not my level uh, to assume this, but I'm sure that somebody is concerned with this. So, NATO have 
a lot of uh, knowledge, not maritime, and not going just to, on maritime. We can have knowledge on cybersecurity. We have knowledge on civil, uh, civil mili military engagement. Engagement. Uh, we have knowledge in so many trans, uh, transverse uh, uh, topics that we may support under, of course, the specification of who needs these uh, capabilities and uh, at the staff level, this can be done. Uh, of course, formalization needs to be done at uh, the respective level. Uh, and of course, I give you an example that even NATO, and I'm Portuguese, so I am quite proud to, sp to speak about this because uh, the Portuguese Navy just provide to NATO something that we encompasses in our missions, not the maritime mission, but also uh, crisis management and risk management on oceanographic, meteorologic, and hydrographic uh, center of excellence. That this is not just for maritime, can support others to go move to plan missions, to plan catastrophes, all this. This is just an example what even NATO, we are improving and creating these kind of things. Don't let me, because I'm Portuguese, I'm referring to a Portuguese COE for my other colleagues from NATO allied countries that are also assisting this, but this is just uh, opportunities that can uh, raise if we are open to them. So now that you know the hub, so you can visit our websites, you can uh, share with us, we will keep the, um, our LinkedIn platform open for bringing ideas because we know that a lot of questions are to be answered and at the proper level, proper timing, we will address to them. Let me also, take this opportunity from our side to thank the people that were behind the scenes, either in TSI and here in the hub to thank uh, their uh, work and time to provide us this platform that for us was really a learning opportunity. Thank you very much from our side. Uh, thank you so much to the hub. Um, this has been, I think, a fantastic uh, example of, of the hub's main purpose, which is to connect and and sh sort of shepherd that process of uh, coordination, collaboration, and uh, ultimately communication. So I, I really appreciate the opportunity to have been your moderator today. Uh, it was a great uh, discussion. I think we had more questions than we could have ever answered in, in the time allotted, uh, which indicates that the discussion needs to continue. Uh, and we need to really look at how to move from conversation to action um, and, and really implement what is being said. Uh, in my final thoughts, I'm, I'm taking away a couple of things. Number one is that if you want to work with the region, you need to work through the region. And there are institutions and mechanisms that are in place that can be leveraged in order to, to build the training, education, and uh, exercising needs uh, that will benefit everyone. Um, the second is that there is a growing concern about closing uh, the maritime land divide, that literal space of where, uh, okay, yes, a pirate may attack 300 miles out, um, but ultimately they're going to bring them the, the, the seafarers back to shore. And so how do, we, how do we make sure that there isn't a blind spot between uh, the land and the sea uh, that we are missing and that we are really recognizing the fact that most maritime security problems are symptoms of problems on land, that though 90% of world trade happens by sea and 70% of the earth is covered in water, 100% 100, 100 of people live on land. Uh, and we need to, to think about how to address those issues uh, as well. Uh, and that goes to the human side of all of this, which is the, the key takeaway, I would say, that transcends every bit of the discussion, which is that people uh, are, are critical at every level. People are who are being attacked at sea uh, and it is people who can respond to them. And in order to create uh, the community of professionals that can be effective in uh, exercising the capacity, showing the capability, using the authority and jurisdiction, uh, working through the legal framework and, and really uh, continuing to build the will uh, to, to resolve these problems, we have to know each other, we have to trust each other. Uh, and that starts with honesty, that starts with relationships uh, and that we need to build. So. Uh, to that, I thank the Hub uh, for helping build those relationships. I thank Three Stones International uh, for uh, the opportunity to, to bring this fantastic group together. Um, and I encourage all of you to not only uh, find everyone that spoke today on LinkedIn and, and 
be a, a continued part of the conversation, uh, but to be part of these discussions in the future, as, as there will be more webinars uh, between the Hub and, and uh, Three Stones International, so there, there's much more to come. Uh, so let's continue, and uh, together uh, we can accomplish this. So thank you all very much. I look forward to our next interaction. Have a wonderful day. And for those who are observing, a very ha happy Ash Wednesday uh, to, to those celebrating. And uh, for those who are not, enjoy the day nonetheless. We are working uh, to build this community. And I thank you for having been a great part of it today.